We are in the hospital office. Oops, audio. Mixer, please. There we go. Um, no, don't want to read this just yet. So yeah, we are now in Brookhaven. This is part three. If you missed part one and part two, they are archived here on Twitch as well as on YouTube. You can do exclamation point YT in chat for a link to the YouTube channel. Um, but in part one, we sort of went through the intro of the game, um, talked about kind of my initial um, analysis of the plot, James's reason for coming to the town, um, and everything that sort of brought him here, the first few characters that he was introduced to. Uh, Demon of Dong, thank you for the prime sub. Thank you, thank you. Um, all the characters that were brought to the town, Angela, Eddie, Laura, everyone who he kind of met along the way, um, up to the point where he meets Maria, and then that was where we left off with part one. Part two, we uh, covered Born from a Wish, the sub-scenario for Silent Hill 2, and basically everything about Maria, where, where she came from, what she is, since she's not really a human. She's a manifestation similar to like the monsters or even Pyramid Head, but... She has kind of her own consciousness, her own will. Um, she's aware of what she is. She has Mary's feelings and memories. So she recognizes James. She knows who James is. Um, she's sort of conflicted with how she feels about James, kind of calling him a bad man at first or agreeing with Ernest calling him a bad man, but then also kind of correcting herself and saying, but he's also kind so there's this sort of duality to her character. She is this new manifestation of a of a person, or at least kind of resembling a person, um, born from James's desires and Mary's memories, but still kind of has her own her own thoughts, her own consciousness. And we start seeing her as the game progresses. We'll see more of that as we go through Brookhaven. Um, with her character becoming more and more of a dual nature, where you kind of see her slipping back and forth between doing things that are similar to her Maria persona and doing things that are more, you know, like Mary. But there's a lot to talk about getting into Brookhaven, so let's start talking about it. Um, these patients, there is kind of an ongoing subplot as you go throughout Brookhaven, uh, involving several other patients that are here in the hospital. You never meet these patients. It's just through notes and information about them, but they serve as parallels to all of our main characters in the story. So this document here seems to be about the patients hospitalized here. Jack Davis. He has attempted suicide three times in the past for reasons unknown. Although he is normally a model patient who follows orders, uh, who follows doctors and nurses' orders, he must be watched closely due to his past pattern of sudden and violent suicide attempts. So, we have this first patient who essentially is suicidal. Normally, they seem okay. Model patient, they follow orders but they have to be watched closely due to sudden violent suicide attempts. And we start seeing kind of an impression of that from Angela's perspective. Uh, for example, the reason that she was sitting there looking at her reflection, contemplating things while holding a knife, uh, that knife is not a weapon. It never even lets you use it as a weapon. Now she, we will, get more information about the knife and the blood on it and things at that point, but you tend to get the idea of Angela's sort of 
suicide uh, or suicidal nature. So we have a parallel there. Um, Joseph Barkin. Next patient. His illness seems to be rooted in the fact that he believes he is guilty of causing his daughter's death. His symptoms suggest a psychotic break and paranoid delusions. Normally calm, but has a tendency towards violence when excited. But this is our parallel to James himself. Um, we have this patient who believes they're guilty of, you know, causing their daughter's death. It's also somewhat similar to what we experience with Ernest Baldwin in uh, the Born from a Wish sub scenario. Um, but again, these sort of parallels to James feeling guilt over his wife's death, although that becomes a much more direct reason as he discovers that he's the one who murdered her himself. Uh, but even before he kind of breaks through his delusion and realizes that fact, he still feels guilt over it. Um, his symptoms suggest a psychotic break in paranoid delusions, both of which James is experiencing. Um, he basically had a psychotic break the moment he arrived into the town because when he first came to the town, he had Mary's body in the backseat of the car and he was here to take his own life. But suddenly he makes up having this letter, having this, you know, uh, false delusion of reality that Mary had already been dead for three years. Um, all these things that are not true are part of his psychotic break and his paranoid delusions. Um, normally calm, but has a tendency towards violence when excited, which James, for the most part, is relatively calm, almost to an eerie level when talking uh, to a lot of the other characters. We see him interact, but we see him also get pretty upset when excited. Um, you know, he starts yelling at Laura, calling her a liar. Um, Things like that, where James does have his moments where he starts letting that that tendency towards violence kind of seep through. Not to mention, it's a bit... You have to kind of separate the, the story James from the gameplay James, but you are also kind of running around shooting and beating monsters and things like that. Lastly, we have Joshua Lewis. History of hospitalization as well as numerous assault battery, and other violent offenses. He has a strong persecution complex and a tendency to solve things through violence. Extreme caution necessary. So this is our parallel to Eddie. Um, Eddie himself has, like, we know that he's shot uh, one person in the knee and he's shot and killed a dog. We don't know the extent of, the full extent of what Eddie has done up to this point in his life. Um, because he's very unreliable. He's also kind of like a compulsive liar uh, that we see throughout things where he's constantly lying or denying any involvement with what's going on. He has this strong persecution complex where he believes people are, you know, always mocking him, making fun of him. Um, later on, we find a corpse where Eddie is like, oh, he's making fun of me with his eyes, you know, just because of the way he looked at you can't uh, go around killing people. So James kind of starts breaking down that uh, element to Eddie when Eddie's kind of like losing his mind. But yeah, that is that persecution complex and obviously Eddie's tendency to solve things through violence. He's leaving behind kind of a trail of corpses. I don't think they're necessarily real people. I think they're more or less manifestations similar to the monsters or Maria. Um but for Eddie, like, because this is a big part of his subconscious, this persecution complex and feeling like people are making fun of him or mocking him, it would make sense that his Silent Hill, what he's experiencing as he goes through the town, is coming across these people who are just poking fun at him and making fun of him and mocking him and sort of pushing him to that point of, you know, psychotic break and tends to solve things through violence. We see it once he thinks James is also making fun of him or realizes that that's when, you know, he starts fighting and, and taking a shot at James. So right off the bat, 
we're going to get little bits and pieces of information throughout Brookhaven about these patients. And it's just interesting to see the way that they're treated, the way that we have these sort of character par uh, parallels between like our three main characters, James, Angela, and Eddie. Something is written on it. The potential for this illness exists in all people, and under the right circumstances, any man or woman would be driven, like him, to the other side. The other side, perhaps, may not be the best way to phrase it. After all, there is no wall between here and there. It lies on the borders where reality and unreality intersect. It is a place both close and distant. Some say it isn't even an illness. I cannot agree with them. I'm a doctor, not a philosopher, or even a psychiatrist. But sometimes I have to ask myself this question. It's true that to us his imaginings are nothing but the inventions of a busy mind, but to him there simply is no other reality. Furthermore, he is happy there. So why, I ask myself, why in the name of healing him must we drag him painfully into the world of our own reality? I love looking at this image too, especially with the enhanced edition where you can see the paper and the text on the paper and everything much more clearly and it lines up with everything we just read. Uh, something else is written by hand. I got the key from Joseph. It's probably the key to that box. Get the purple bull key. A key from Joseph. So this was the patient who felt responsible for his daughter's death, the one who's a parallel to James himself. The key doesn't even quite look like a key. It's just sort of like a square, more of like a key card, like a square of metal uh, with a purple bull drawn on it, found on the desk in the document room. Also kind of blinking red there, so we're going to heal up. It's a clever way of delivering character exposition without making it super overt. Correct. Like that is, it serves a dual purpose. Like all, like also on top of just describing these new characters and kind of treating them as parallels, but by telling you more about these side characters, you're explaining a little bit more obvious things about our main characters. So yeah, it is a really nice way to give us some character exposition, uh, add a little bit more depth to all of our main characters without just having them outright say it or finding, you know, a specific note that's, you know, says, you know, Eddie was being pursued after shooting somebody in the leg or, uh, Things like that, you know. They could have been a lot more direct with that kind of information. I guess Eddie's pretty direct with it. He tells you it himself. But you know what I mean. There's little hints like Angela's suicidal nature. You know, they don't really have to explain it very directly. But they can explain it sort of directly when talking about this this other hospital patient and just sort of let it be a, a parallel so that you can kind of draw that conclusion on your own. Interesting audio here. You start hearing that uh, like labored breathing like through a uh, an oxygen mask or a, almost an, an iron lung. Some sort of breathing device. And looking around, there's not really a whole lot of areas we can go to on the first floor. Double check, we did pick up a map as soon as we entered. So, yeah, you can see there's the elevator. Um, you can go into that front office. There's a lounge and examination room, but those are both locked. There's an elevator that does not work. Um, and then some other areas that we can't even get to. 
is they're blocked off by random bits of garbage. There's the entire first floor wing, patient wing, that uh, is also locked. So kind of going through all of our options, we can't see anything else on the first floor and we can't go further down. So up to floor two. So here we are in the second floor of Brookhaven. Uh, we actually do see the, um, I think this hallway in particular, like this camera shot right here. I think we see this area in the uh, Silent Hill 2 remake trailer. We see a very short sequence of a nurse like walking this direction and James comes out from this door with a pipe or a, a stick or something and starts hitting the nurse. It's a very short sequence. It's like maybe a second and a half long or whatever in the, uh, in the remake trailer that's already out. But I think that's this little spot right here in Brookhaven. Maria used the knife you have and helped James. Yeah. She, again, thinking about, <laughs> How she's probably still got that Chinese cleaver from the uh, Born from a Wish scenario. But she just stands there. She's, she's already killed a bunch of these things in the Baldwin Mansion by this point. Maybe this is because she remembers who James is. You're an asshole. You killed me. I'm just going to stand back. I'm just going to stand back and see what happens. Can't open it. Something inside the pocket of the white lab jacket. Got the examination room key. So we can open up that room on the first floor, the examination room. There's a magazine here. That won't do me any good right now. You can really look at, get a good look at all these little things in the environment, the magazine and cover that's on the desk there. It's sitting next to like a football for some reason. There's a poster, wild, something wild. Just like a head laying on a pile of skulls. This is no time to be looking at a stupid poster. I like how because of the way this is set up, James like turns and looks at the camera. It's no time to be looking at a stupid poster. Although, if you do look at the stupid poster, it kind of looks like Maria. It's a woman with, like, similar haircut. That, that blonde, shoulder-length haircut. Also, like, a poster of a woman there in that locker that Maria's kind of standing in front of. Like long brown hair. None of the other lockers open. Exactly, he's shaming you. For looking at the stupid poster. How dare you. Poster there of someone named Jack. I wish there was a way to... 
get a better look at some of these. It's Jack. He's got his coat open and no shirt on underneath. The hero did, that we didn't know that we deserve, or something like that. Maria's fine, just standing over here in the corner. Shotgun in the locker. Doesn't look like there's anything useful in here. But we finally get a better gun. We've been using the handgun this whole time as, like, our only projectile. Now we've got a shotgun. Maximum capacity, six shots, which is pretty damn good for a fucking shotgun like that. <laughs> Tough to use, but can attack opponents in a group. And it does have quite a spread on it. It'll do a lot of damage if you manage to be close enough or position yourself in such a way where the full spread or most of the spread will hit an enemy. This was the examination room key we got earlier. Examination room written on the tag found in the pocket of the white lab jacket in the men's locker room. Also, since I was talking about it earlier, Angela's knife. Knife from Angela. I don't plan on using this as a weapon. You never get an opportunity. Use it as a weapon. Interestingly enough, it gives you a use prompt. Even though there's not ever a situation in the game where you can use it as like an item and get some sort of reaction. So I don't know if maybe originally there was something more planned with it or if that's just like a hey mess around with this because examining it does do something. So you can examine it and it gives you its description. The blade is stained with something red but more than this, this is one of the things that Silent Hill 2 is using to track what ending you're going to get. So there's a lot of various little things throughout the course of this game that the game is constantly keeping track of that are always kind of affecting the path that you're on for what ending you're going to achieve. And looking at this knife, examining it in your inventory is basically you're considering the same thing that Angela was considering when she was laying on the floor looking at this knife. You're, you're think the game interprets that as you are thinking of suicide. This is not a dream. And What's happening to this place? For James, you know, to stop and examine this in his inventory, it uh, it's supposed to reflect that idea. So this counts towards the in-water ending, where uh, that is essentially what happens. James commits suicide. So looking at that and looking at certain notes uh, and other elements will affect your ending. Same thing for reading, looking at this letter and looking at this photo uh, will also affect things. Um, Yoshio, thank you so much for the raid. Very much appreciate it. Hope you're doing well. Hope you had a good stream. Welcome, welcome. Go ahead and look at Mary. Look at this nice enhanced edition touched up graphic. The letter from Mary, which at this point in the game, the delusion, James's delusion, is still holding strong. So the letter is still here. The writing is still on the on the paper. The paper is still on the envelope. The envelope still has Mary's name on it. That will change. That will change. Ow. What's wrong? I just pricked myself. Are you okay? Yeah. Got the bent needle. I always like the way that cutscene plays out with Maria, where the cutscene starts and it looks like James is there by himself. He hurts himself. He pricks himself with the needle, which doesn't quite line up with his fingers here. <laughs> Um, and Maria just sort of like walks into the shot like she's not even there and you just sort of see her walk in to the shot and then after James responds to her she just sort of walks back out behind him 
So the way the scene kind of starts and ends, it's like she's not there, not really there. I don't know if that's an intentional thing or what, but it, it the cinematography works very well, sort of emphasizing Maria as as a character where you're kind of constantly questioning if she even is there. Hey, Yoshio. Thanks again for the raid. Hope you're doing well. Uh, isn't killing X amount of enemies melee and ranged effect, effect an ending? And that's why Maria doesn't help, because you have to prove <laughs> prove to her you're worth being with. Um, so when you're just going for the actual ending, usually killing enemies uh, melee and ranged, it doesn't affect your ending, it affects your score. So if you're going for like 10 star... Uh, your your high rank at the end of the uh, results screen that plays a big effect but yeah it it doesn't really affect the ending in fact give me a moment I could have all of that bookmarked since a lot of people don't really n know about how this game calculates endings even people who are very familiar with this game um thought I had. Yeah. So this was originally put together by a Silent Hill hacker, speedrunner, mod maker named Joey, uh, Jokey. Um, and Jokey put up here. I can just share this readme in chat if anybody wants to go through it kind of on their own. Uh, that GitHub link in chat. But just to uh, read this out, it's essentially this is a Silent Hill 2 ending guide that it does a perfect breakdown of everything that this game is tracking and calculating to determine what ending you get. So, for example, the ritual ending or the rebirth ending, um, you basically just have to have each of the necessary items. The Book of Lost Memories the Crimson Ceremony, the White Chrism, and the Obsidian go uh, Goblet. But for things like the Leave ending, the Maria ending, the In Water ending, those are all a little bit more nebulous where people didn't really know for a long time exactly what affected what. So, for example, the Leave ending. Well, you start at five points, and each of these things will add one point each. So if you listen to the whole sickbed conversation, uh, if you heal in excess of 200% HP, so if you heal a lot, if you've never gotten the leave ending but have gotten the Maria ending, or if you've never gotten the leave ending but have gotten the in-water ending, each of those will add a point. And then if you go east after meeting Maria and have her remind you the way back to the hotel will deduct from that. So all these weird little things that will trigger whether or not you get the leave ending. For the Maria ending, it starts at three points, and each of these things adds one point. Spend ten minutes or more near Maria. Bump into Maria less than three times. Take no damage in the entire game, or Maria takes less than 3% the damage you took from monsters. Check back on Maria in the hospital. Trying to go back to see Maria after she's died in the labyrinth twice. Never got the Maria ending, but did get the leave ending. And never got the Maria ending, but did get the in-water ending. So if you've already gotten endings, the game even tracks which ones you've gotten. So it'll try to influence which one you get on your next playthrough. It tries to give you a little bit more lenient uh, scoring towards an ending you haven't already gotten. Now for the in-water ending, it starts at two points each, and each of these events adds one point. Reading the diary on the, ho on the hospital rooftop, which we're going to do. Listening to the entire sickbed conversation, which we're going to do. Reading the second message in Neely's bar, uh, which we're going to do. We're going to do all of this just because we're being very thorough and very in-depth. Uh, examining Angela's knife at least once. So taking the time to look at that in your inventory does count towards the in-water ending. Have a bad health score above 60 and have a bad health score above 240. 
So the bad health score, meaning essentially how long you run around without healing. Um, and then if you've never gotten the ending before. So once the game calculates all of that information on your playthrough, it essentially has a formula in order to work out which ending you get based on what events you did, what triggers you set off, and, you know, which endings you've already gotten, uh, all that sort of information. It takes all that into detail. Is it okay to ask for the Maria ending? <laughs> I'm not going for any specific ending. It will most likely be the leave ending or the in water ending, just based on the things that I do when I'm being very thorough and being in depth, uh, doing like these, these types of playthroughs. Gonna be wild as fuck to see all that reduced to a series of binary choices in the remake. Oh, that is another thing that I worry about. Where all of that could easily break down into, you know, push A or push B. Go left or go right type stuff. Alright, let's continue. Some supplies, just the creepy environment of Brookhaven itself. There's some new ambient music when you're out in the hallways and things, but you also have these really just dead, quiet fucking hospital rooms. A lot of them are trashed. Hospitals are kind of naturally creepy places anyway. I guess not to everybody. I know personally I'm not a big fan of, of hospitals. Never, never have liked being in hospitals. So being in ones that are like run down and dirty and gross is like even worse. Scattered papers, just plain white paper. There's a typewriter here. I've got no use for this. Wait a minute, what's this? There's a sheet of carbon paper still stuck in the typewriter. I can still read the imprint left on it. I know it. I know the number of the box. 8342. I can't help him anymore. The button key doesn't scare me, so nobody can stop who I am. I don't know who I am is. Who I am is. Who I am is. So, we start seeing all this crazy writing. And the writing itself actually does change from riddle difficulty to riddle difficulty. Um, so if you're playing on, like, easy riddle, this text is a little bit different. If you're playing on hard riddle or extra riddle, this text is a little bit different. But ultimately, it always gives you the same information. It gives you a four-digit number that we're going to need to open up a particular box. And it's a box that's going to require four different keys actually open uh, so when you do the Silent Hill 4 lore playthroughs you go towards one of the bad ones because of the lore in it is there an ending in this one that's better for lore playthroughs uh, not especially like because the devs like themselves has said have said there's not like a, a canon ending or anything. And even for Silent Hill 4, like I try to divvy up endings as much as I can. I'll I'll let you in on a little secret. Silent Hill 4 is just kind of a hard game. And sometimes trying to stop and take time and explain everything in that game um basically just means Eileen is spending more time around enemies and in danger, which means she's more likely to become possessed, which means she's more likely to die, which means it's most likely going to be a bad ending playthrough. So Silent Hill 4, more often than not, winds up being a bad ending playthrough just because of that fact. 
stopping and trying to talk about things while also trying to take care of Eileen doesn't usually work out well. And she winds up being a lot more possessed. In fact, to get the most information out of a Silent Hill 4 playthrough, you need Eileen to be possessed by the time you get to Forest World the second time. Because she needs to be possessed in order to read Walter's writing on the walls and trees and stuff in that zone. So, yeah, 4 winds up being bad ending playthroughs a lot of the time. It's just a very different system how it determines your ending in 4. 4, four is very binary. It is just, did you cleanse the room? Yes, no. Did you save Eileen? Yes, no. All it looks at is that criteria, and that determines the ending for 4. For Silent Hill 2, there's way more stuff going on. Uh, Paprika. Paprika, welcome back. Thank you so much for the five months. Very much appreciate that support. Thank you, thank you. Welcome back. Hope you're doing well. Sure we're not missing any rooms here while we explore. Some of these camera angles and uh, the layouts with like the beds kind of making a very narrow place for nurses and things to attack you reminds me a lot of Alcamilla Hospital in, si in the first Silent Hill. Like, from an atmosphere standpoint, I think they're two very different, very distinct creepy hospitals, you know? Um, two things that could have wound up being a lot more similar that wind, wind up being pretty different. But every once in a while, you get some of these rooms like this one, where it just kind of makes me... It gives me that Silent Hill 1 vibe. Seeing the older beds. This this layout, there's a room in Silent Hill 1 that's exactly this room layout. Where you have a nurse on one side and a nurse on the other side. So you're sort of like forced to walk in in between these two beds in like a very narrow space. Where these two nurses can kind of flank you. So... Every once in a while, there's some of these spots in Brookhaven that kind of reminds me of Alcamilla. Nothing here that looks useful. Junk piled up at the end of the hallway. And it'll be interesting when we get to Silent Hill 3, after we finish this playthrough, um, revisiting Brookhaven and talking about a lot of this stuff as well. Because it's essentially the same Brookhaven. There's some minor differences. There's a cover over the elevator's call button. It's locked and I can't get it open. So that's everything here except for the room at the end of the hall, the day room. Is this a texture mod? Yeah, uh, ADHD Werewolf. This is the Enhanced Edition mod for Silent Hill 2 PC. Uh, you can type exclamation point EE -E in chat for more info on that. Alright, so that should be everywhere we can go except for the day room on this side, but this is all locked for sure. Silent Hill 2 is probably the better game, but I just love Heather as a protagonist. I mean, Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3 are my number one and number two favorite games. Uh, out of, and, like, it's so close. It's so close between them. The only reason I, I consider 2 a little bit, like, barely one pixel above Silent Hill 3 on the tier list is just because it's a self-contained story story it it has everything you need to know and appreciate the game right within its own confines you don't need to play the rest of the franchise to play and understand and appreciate silent hill 2 silent hill 3 is really good it's really really good it looks and sounds and feels better in a lot of ways than silent hill 2 
They clean up the controls. They're more familiar with the PlayStation 2 hardware, so they do better moving textures. Like, improve on everything. The only thing is the story. Story is such a huge part. Huge, huge part of Silent Hill for me. It might not be for everybody. But, yeah, three, the story is is very good. It's not quite as good as two. I would still say it's almost as good as two. As long as you play and understand Silent Hill 1 really, really well. Um, because it is... It is the perfect sequel. Three is like a perfect way to do a sequel. And I feel like three does such a great job. Exactly. Three makes one a better game and one makes three a better game. But playing them without the other kind of detracts from their own individual experiences. Um, not bad, just not as good. So that's why Silent Hill 2 kind of takes it for me. Because it manages to be so good and have so much depth um, and still be self-contained. You don't feel like you're missing part of the, the story. By the time you finish it, you you feel like everything sort of is there already. The only thing that you could argue is kind of missing from playing other games in the, in the series is a little bit more information on the history of the cult. Which does play a, a minor role through this, but it's it's such a background element that it just kind of fits in like the town itself, you know, the fog. It's something that's always there and you can always enjoy it and learn a little bit more about it than what's in Silent Hill 2 but it's not necessary to understand and appreciate the main aspects of Silent Hill 2 alright so we've got a locked patient wing on this floor a locked special treatment room and no code for this particular thing. I guess you could. Most likely people would. If you were playing this for the first time. If you're doing everything in order. Like I am. You'd probably get to this point And you would want to try the four numbers. That were on the typewriter. Which. Anyone write those down? I didn't. Um, 8342. So you'd probably think to try that. Which will not work. We'll keep exploring. Roof is currently locked. That's it. So, everywhere has been thoroughly explored. Every door has been checked. And the one thing that we still have is the examination room key. So we're going to head there next. That is this door right here. Can I just say how naturally kind of creepy it is to just walk into a room and Maria is never just like standing behind you or next to you when you enter into a place. She's just like, bam, she's already fucking there. You kind of jump scare yourself walking into some of these rooms where you'll get a camera change and you kind of forget that she's with you. And then you're into another room and suddenly Maria's there. Without static, constantly changing camera angles. And without loading screens in between doors and in between rooms. That's an aspect that basically won't exist for the remake. Unless they figure out a completely different technical way or cinematic way to do that. Again, it's exactly Yami. It's more things to kind of put it in the player's head that Maria might not be real. And it makes you question who or what she is, kind of what her existence is. 
Which is why, like, I get why they suggest playing Born from a Wish as a follow-up. I definitely think it's better as a follow-up to the main scenario. Because it does kind of spoil that Maria is, like, a manifestation. That she's not real, but... I also think it's interesting, for the sake of these story playthroughs, to do Born from a Wish right after James meets Maria. So you kind of go through the story of Silent Hill 2 knowing what Maria is and understanding why all these sort of little things with her character are like that. Why she never interacts with any other real characters. Why she pops up in these sort of weird, creepy setup ways while you're escorting her around. Yeah. There are medical records on the desk. Nothing particularly interesting. Shotgun shells. Since we picked up the shotgun shells, and I kind of want to point this out since you can see it a lot more clearly in the Enhanced Edition. Now, Enhanced Edition recreates or uses AI to enhance a lot of the artwork for the inventory. I think they just straight up recreate a lot of the artwork based on the originals. Um, but it's interesting getting a closer look at some of the uh, textures and things that are there. Oh, did it automatically... It automatically loads them in when you pick them up if you don't already have six. Oh no, wait, we do have them. I'm just out of handgun ammo. So I wanted to just look at the, the ammunition. It's all birds. Uh, so the shotgun shells are crow brand ammunition. But uh, we'll have to wait until we pick up some more handgun ammo and later on the rifle ammo to show you the other ones. There's a memo hanging on the refrigerator. Bird shot? It's not It's not just like a picture of a bird on the shotgun shells because they are bird shot. It is bird branded bullets. My favorite BBB acronym. Bird branded bullets. Because handgun bullets I think are Penguin? It's like penguin, crow, and eagle or something like that. For handgun, shotgun, and rifle. Anyway. So, here's the important thing that we need out of here. You can kind of explore around. There's a little bit, another thing I want to look at in here before we leave, but the important thing is third floor, patient wing hall, 7335. So it gives us the uh, the code to get into the third floor. Now, if you're on normal riddle, which I am, that is what you get. It just straight up tells you, hey, here's the code. And if you've got a good memory and you play this game a lot, if you're always on normal difficulty, that code will always be 7335. It doesn't randomize or change from playthrough to playthrough. And there's a memo hanging on the refrigerator. Food only. Do not store drugs. So James doesn't think to open the fridge, or maybe there's nothing in it, so he doesn't he doesn't comment on it. Um, in Silent Hill 3, which also brings you to Brookhaven, you can come into this exact same room as, uh, as Heather and examine this fridge, and the exact same note is stuck on the fridge. Food only. Do not store drugs. Um... But then there is a health drink stuck in the refrigerator that you can you can pick up. And there's a little comment there about whether or not that counts as food. Because I don't know. Silent Hill 3 library puzzle broke you? On hard mode, yeah, the Shakespeare puzzle broke me too. Even after all these years, in knowing exactly how to work out that puzzle and knowing exactly what the solution is and explaining it all in depth, it still hurts my brain thinking that that was real <laughs> and put into a game. All right. 
Now we've got access to this patient wing. And a whole new floor. Look at all these doors to go and examine. But first, Maria needs a little break. James. <coughs> Wait a minute. <coughs> I'm kind of tired. <laughs> it's just a hangover. You should rest. Mm. <clears throat> so comfy. I'm gonna go look for her. For Laura. I'll be back as soon as I can. The so Maria starts coughing and says, Don't worry, it's nothing, you know. She's feeling a little out of it. It's, it's just a hangover. So coughing is not a typical symptom for most hangovers. Um, and she takes out like a little prescription bottle and starts taking pills. And prescription pills are also not usually typical for a hangover. So already you've kind of got this idea that there's something more going on with Maria than what she's letting on. For James, right away he starts feeling concerned, telling her to rest, telling her to lay down. And already this is triggering memories and things in James's mind where he has to think about Mary, his wife. This woman who looks almost identical to his wife, now coughing, now also showing signs of some sort of illness. So it's James, you know, having to come to terms with these aspects of his life and what he's done. And it's more than just the town manifesting things and forcing them to be in front of James to make him encounter these things, to make him come to terms with it. Um, Maria was given a choice. Looking at the, at the Born from a Wish sub scenario, she has her own choice, her own free will. She didn't have to be here. She didn't have to interact with James at all if she didn't want to. But she still chose to. I think probably some part of her as Mary that remembers him killing her wants him to come to terms with it as well. So it's interesting to sort of look at all of this starting to take hold. Where something as simple as Maria starting to show illness. Well, that's going to start having this major effect on James' psyche. Um, you can get a little bit more dialogue here with Maria if you try and talk with her again. James, I want to ask you something. What if... What if you can't find Mary? What will you do? I haven't thought about that. And again, she she's very well aware of, like, kind of what she is, who she is, and who James is. So when she's asking these questions, kind of probing to see what response he gives, she's testing him. She's trying to see where his his head's at. Um, you also get a nice close shot during those uh, close-ups where it's showing her laying on the bed of the butterfly tattoo on her stomach. Again, symbol uh, symbolism used throughout the game uh, and throughout a lot of the Silent Hill games to sort of represent reincarnation, rebirth, um, or transitioning be between two different phases, uh, the way a caterpillar becomes a cocoon, becomes a moth or a butterfly. Um, the same way Mary, in a way, sort of becomes Maria, or Maria is created because of Mary. So you have all these aspects of reincarnation and rebirth represented in the butterfly, something as small as the butterfly tattoo on. <coughs> I'll be okay soon. <coughs> Did you find Laura? 
So there's her two concerns. And after that, that's the last bit of dialogue that Maria will give. Who <clears throat> rotates back and forth I between ask the you two. Something. What if What if you can't find Mary? What will you do? I haven't thought about that. So that's all she wants to do is press James for reminding him about Mary and what could happen if he doesn't find her. And <coughs> what about Laura? Because that's the only other person I'll she cares about. <coughs> Did you find Laura? And she's already showing concern. They, like, if you think about Maria as being this separate individual person... She never knew Laura. She never met Laura. She has no reason to have any attachment to Laura whatsoever. But Mary did. Mary was in the hospital, and Laura was one of Mary's only friends, only people that she had uh, in contact with her while she was at that hospital. Uh, which, by the way, I should point out, is not this hospital. Uh, they didn't live in Silent Hill. Mary was not a patient of Brookhaven. They came here on vacation once. That was at the very beginning, before Mary was even really showing signs of illness. After that, they never came back here. So, uh, until the events of this game. Um, so just to put that out there, because that's one of those sort of misinformation bits of lore that a lot of a lot of people tend to get wrong. That Mary was a patient here uh, when she wasn't. But Laura was the only person, you know, kind of close to Mary while she was in the hospital. And because she had such a high level of concern and, and attachment to Laura, that feeling and those memories are in Maria as well. So Maria is already showing that level of concern where those are the only two things she's, po she's going to pester James about. Remind him about Mary. Ask about Laura because she's legitimately concerned about her. Get the roof key. <laughs> Deal with that mannequin in a moment. Uh, some more green ooze. More green slime. Uh, we first see this in the apartments. In the hole in the wall where you're looking for the key to open the clock and be able to move the hands. Uh, so it's one of those things where it's not ever really like explained what it's supposed to be, what it could potentially represent. It's just, it's creepy. It's kind of gross and it's eye catching. It's like neon green. Um, so once again, the same way the green ooze, sort of draws your attention and draws your eye to go and examine a hole in the wall. Here, drawing your attention, drawing your eye, and bringing you to examine this hole in the floor. Something stuck in the drainage pipe. See the green ooze kind of still around the edge of the pipe, even in the close-up art. And there is something stuck in there. It's much easier to see it on the Enhanced Edition, but... It's uh, it's an ear. There's a keychain on. It's a key on a keychain, but the keychain is shaped like a human ear. There's something just kind of creepy about looking into this drainage pipe the first time and seeing like, is that an ear in there? I really want that. Do I, is that something I want to pull out? Silent Hill game, so you can only assume so. The hole is too small. I can't get my hand inside to reach it. Maybe if I had a long, narrow tool of some kind. And despite literally having several narrow, long tools in his inventory, we'll have to come back to this later. Still locked. Can't even get to this one. Third floor patient room. A 
save point. A little quiet room away from all this horror and chaos. That's everything up this hallway. We're now in the farthest patient room uh, from where we entered the wing, S14. And this was one of those patients, uh, Joseph. This was their room. So we've already found a note talking about uh, this box that Joseph had. We've already found... Three of the four keys needed to open it. But not quite everything. But there's something written on the wall. Luis, I'll take care of you forever. It's my destiny. So we see this writing pattern in other notes written by this patient, Joseph, uh, where he misspells words sort of with other spellings and Luis I'll take care of you for instead of for it's for it's not like a typo in the text of the game or anything it's intentional it's the way that this patient writes these notes and sometimes it gives little hints about things uh, for example this just giving you the number four I think is a clue that you need four different things to open this box so we have two physical locks on it uh like two different you have a slot for a key here a slot for a key here or a lock that uses a key here and then you have two keypads uh, one with a like rotating dial and one that's just like a push button keypad uh with two codes to open this all up so incredibly secured box that we have here First, we'll use the purple bull key and the lapis eye key that was picked up earlier. An eye is carved into the top of the key. The iris part is made of a lapis lazuli. This was inside one of the patient rooms on the other floor. It gives you a pretty detailed like view of it when you're examining it. Purple bull key and lapis eye key. Both go in, removes those. Now we need two different four-digit numbers. We've only gotten one of them. That's this number, 8342. But we still need one more four-digit number. We'll have to come back. A whole lot of effort just to get inside this one box so obviously it's gonna have something really good in it right and at this point the other thing that we found was the key to the roof uh, this was on the third floor room where Maria was resting we're gonna stop back in double check on Maria before we go to the roof James I want to ask you something same dialogue as before. He's still here. Same music and everything as before. Now we have access to the roof. And... The roof, interestingly enough, kind of has like all of these guard fences around it. And you have to imagine this is a mental, Brookhaven is, is meant to be like primarily a mental institution, mental health facility. Um, 
with Alcamilla being more like the, the general hospital. And you would have patients with mental issues coming up onto the roof, considering jumping, which uh, is part of the implication we get from this diary. And again, things that are optional, like looking at this diary, looking at Angela's knife in your inventory, doing these optional things that have kind of like a suicidal uh, element to them or that relate in some way to, uh, to suicide are more likely to lead you towards the in water ending where James himself commits suicide. So the game is already picking up on all these things that you're doing and using that to determine your ending. It's a really interesting concept. It's something that Silent Hill Shattered Memories, I think, also does really well with the exception of advertising it. The only bad thing about Shattered Memories doing it is that they they advertise that that's how the game works. Um, but other than that, you know, I think that's a cool concept that you have all these relatively subtle optional things that are throughout a playthrough um, that will change the ending that you get without it being a very direct thing like, oh, I just went and examined this thing without it being very obvious that like, oh, I'm making a choice towards an outcome here. Have the patient's diary, May 9th, rain, stared out the window all day, peaceful here, nothing to do, still not allowed to go outside. May 10th, still raining, talked with the doctor a little, would they have saved me if I didn't have a family to feed? I know I'm pathetic, weak, not everyone can be strong. May 11th, rain again, the meds made me feel sick today, if I'm only better when I'm drugged, then who am I anyway? May 12th, Rain as usual. I don't want to cause any more trouble for anyone, but I'm a bother either way. Can it really be such a sin to run instead of fight? Some people may say so, but they don't have to live in my shoes. It may be selfish, but it's what I want. It's too hard like this. Just too hard. When they're talking about running and fighting, I mean, obviously they're not talking about literally running and fighting. You know, if you're dealing with all of this illness and everything else, and this patient feels like they're putting up a fight just to live, where running would be just giving in and not living any. Um, some people may say so, um, but they don't have to live in my shoes, talking about their perspective. Other people try to convince them that it's okay, but they're you know, unable to move past it. It may be selfish, but it's what I want. Too hard like this. Then the following... May 13th, it's clear outside. The doctors told me I've been released, that I've got to go home. I, and then it trails off there. And you can see on the actual pages, it's matching uh, everything that the text says. And the trail off after I is sort of just like this long, drawn out scribble. The diary ends here. There are no more entries. What was the diary doing up here? So, again, optional completely to come over and examine this diary, but doing so gives you a point, essentially, towards getting the in-water ending. And, yeah, it gives you the impression of one of the Brookhaven patients, possibly one of the ones that we read about, such as the one who was prone to multiple suicide attempts. Specifically, um, the one who was a parallel somewhat to Angela. And even some of this dialogue, like some of this diary, the way that it's written and the sort of feeling that it conveys, try to keep that in mind much later when we have this conversation with Angela on the, the burning staircase where she's talking about sort of being beyond help and just wanting to give up, not wanting to fight. So... Again, we have this patient that has attributes to them that are parallels to Angela and this diary that sort of, again, plays as a parallel towards that character to give a little more insight, not only into this patient as like a side character, but also to reflect that and sort of 
look at our other characters like Angela and even James himself, especially in the In Water ending, um, about how they would be interpreting these elements, these other patients who are kind of reflections of some of their own psychological aspects. Seemingly, that's all there is on the roof. If you try to go back through the door, though, the door won't open. Something is holding it closed from the other side. It won't open no matter how hard I try. So no going back the way we came. And it's not locked. It's not jammed. We just came through there. Like, we unlocked it with a key. And they kind of try to lure your eye this way, you know? Like, oh, there's only one other door up here. And it's this one. The metal net is rusty and falling apart. It looks like if I push hard, I could move it away. Speaking of push hard to move things away, I have to push a button to make this text move away. And as long as I don't do that, Pyramid Head has like an invisible wall there that he can't really get through. So we can just kind of sit here and chill. Look at Pyramid Head bombing around down there. Are you finished reading that? Yeah. Be patient, Pyramid Head. I'm a very slow reader. And there goes Pyramid Head. That is the last time that we see Pyramid Head with his great knife. His iconic great knife. A lot of people associate Pyramid Head so closely with that knife. And he honestly doesn't really have it for that much. Uh, because the next time we see him, he's going to be sporting a new spear. So we fell from the roof down to the third floor. We crashed into the special treatment room that was previously locked. And that encounter with Pyramid Head, it always, doesn't matter difficulty or anything like that. You have to do that sequence to progress. You have to go to the roof and get knocked off into the third floor uh, by Pyramid Head. It will always put you two hits away from death. You basically have one hit point right now. Uh, and the reason why one hit point is two hits away from death is just because of how the HP and damage mechanics in this game work. So every attack does like a specific amount of damage. We'll say, uh, you know, a nurse swinging a pipe at you hits you and does 15 damage. Now, if you have less than that amount, if you have like three hit points and the nurse hits you for 15, you don't die. Your HP goes to zero. And whenever your HP is at zero, the next thing that will hit you will kill you if you don't heal. And I think they kind of do that as like a little bit of a buffer for this game, since you can specifically get an ending by not healing. And they didn't want to put you in a position where you are just one hit away from death. So with this, they have Pyramid Head knock you off the roof. Your health is very low, but if you're trying to specifically go for the in-water ending and you don't want to risk using a heal at this point, you don't have to heal and you'll still survive at least one hit. Whatever hits you after that will kill you. But... We're not too concerned with it. We'll go ahead and heal up. If 
but just an interesting kind of a note about the mechanics there. Something's written on the wall. If Joseph looks calm, he can be taken out of his cell. So you can see out of all of the patients that we kind of get information about, we're mostly focusing around Joseph, which makes sense. This is a parallel to James. So that is the information that's most relevant to James. That's what the town is going to manifest around James and into his reality. It's going to be things that are relevant to him, such as this patient who is very much like him. So Joseph basically has his own actual room, but then this note saying, you know, Joseph, if he looks calm, he can be taken out of his cell. So Joseph would go back and forth between his patient room and this smaller isolated cell. And all this blood over here on the wall is our last four digit number in order to, uh, Open up Joseph's mysterious box. Turn, turn, turn the numbers. Better not forget them. So I'll write them down here. The other one, my secret name. So you have to look at these scribbles on the wall. And I've seen many people get stuck here because... What do you think this number is, chat? If you see these numbers written on the wall, just as they are, as you see them on your screen, what numbers do those look like? A lot of people saying 2947, 2947. Most people assuming that it's 2947. Or 3 instead of 7. Yeah, you start noticing that little wobbly smear in the seven, right? So maybe that's not a seven. Maybe that's a three. Or seven, nine, four, three. You're noticing that the first number is curved kind of like a two, but the bottom is not there. So maybe that's a seven and not a two. Maybe it's a really curvy seven. The point is like, you don't all know. You don't all know for sure. You Everybody can look at these numbers and that first digit to some of you might immediately think it's a two. You might immediately think it's a seven. That last digit might be a three. It might be a seven, you know, but the two in the middle, you can kind of tell like that's definitely a nine. That's definitely a four. So it's really just like that first and last one that are kind of on the fence between a few different things they could they could potentially be. So this changes depending on what difficulty you're playing on. If you're playing on easy riddle difficulty, the font, like it's an entire font for numbers one through nine, um, because this number is randomized whenever you play, uh, do a playthrough. So whenever it randomizes this number, it pulls from that font, puts these numbers on the screen. And the easier the difficulty is, the easier it is to read the font. So easy difficulty riddles, it's a little bit less blurry. And most of the numbers, you can tell what they are. There's not really any question or confusion as to, is that a seven? Is that a two? They look pretty much like what they're supposed to. Normal, which is what I'm playing on, most of the numbers uh, look how they should. Like you can tell what they are. A few of the numbers, like seven, nine, three, or excuse me, seven, three, two, um, a few of these numbers, the way they look is kind of blurry and it's kind of weird. And there's a little bit of questioning them on hard riddle. It's even more messed up and more of the numbers are smudged and kind of look like other numbers. And then on extra riddle, it's even more messed up and things are even more smudged and, and ambiguous. So the difficulty changes how hard it is to just read the font, to look at these numbers. Well, let's go see who was right. Let's go see what the combination was. But yeah, I see a lot of people tend to get stuck there because some of those numbers, it's just hard to tell. You look at him and you think that for sure has to be a seven. 
and it's not. So uh, the most common answer, the first one that people started posting was 2947. And that's going to be wrong. I already know what it is. I like seeing how people read this font. Because I've gotten so used to reading it, I don't think twice about it anymore. But that's from playing this game thousands and thousands of times. The diary didn't have any typos, did it? No, it didn't. So you can rule out that the diary was written by Joseph. Uh, again, I think it was written by the uh, other suicidal patient. Seven, nine, four, three. Seven, nine, four, three. It was seven, nine, four, seven. I should have turned the other dial first. So that first one that everyone was so sure was a two. Yeah, that was a curvy ass seven. That was the curliest seven you've ever seen in your entire life. And everyone fell for it. Normal difficulty, by the way. It's even worse on hard and extra. Depending on what number you get. Depending on what actual digits are randomly there. Because even on harder difficulties, if you get a good set of numbers where they look pretty clear as to what they are, there's not a lot of confusion to them, you can still get an easier-to-read puzzle. But we just happened to get two of the weirder-looking digits in this one. The first place 7 and the last place 7, where that first 7 is curly as fuck, and it looks like a weird 2. It's even got like a line of blood kind of further down from where the numbers are that you can mistake it as being like the bottom line of the 2. And then that last seven, which is also really weird and curvy and looks kind of like a three. But you go through all that trouble, getting those four-digit codes, getting those keys, scouring this hospital to get the four things needed to open this box, and you finally open it, and there's nothing inside the box. No, I'm wrong. There are a few hairs inside. And I love that James just takes them. There's something about just thinking about survival horror characters, protagonists, just being the most weird klepto people of all time. That's probably one of the more charming things about this, this genre of games, right? Because you always have to suspend your, your belief and immersion and everything to sort of let a video game be a video game sometimes. But it's really funny thinking about just like the real life terms of that. Like here's James. He's wandering around this horrible hospital. He's killing monsters that look very human. These nurses look and sound kind of human. Um, he's dealing with the trauma. He's trying to come to terms with what he's done with his wife. He's gone through, found all these weird keys and solved these weird puzzles, got these weird numbers, open this box and there's some hair in it. And he's just like, yeah, I'll take that with me. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. Give me those strands of hair. And now we have hair. Piece of hair, long brown hair. It was in that quote unquote box. Why'd you put box in quotes? I mean, that is. How else would you define it? I'm pretty sure that's a box. But now. We can return to. Ooze covered hole in the ground. Does the hair even do anything? It's very important. But we can use it here. I'll never be able to snare it like this. So the hair is the long narrow tool that you need to reach inside the drain, but the hair by itself cannot snare the key. Can't snare with the hair. You need a bent needle. 
rusty bent needle. It was stuck in that stuffed animal in the locker room. Got it. Got the elevator key. Use the hair, tie it to the bent needle, and fish up the elevator key. This feels like one of the most sort of like dated puzzle kind of things. Like this feels like a point and click puzzle from the mid 90s, the early 90s, compared to even 2001 when this game came out. But I still like it. I like the creepiness of it. The fact that you're using hair and uh, this weird bent needle. Moon logic. Yeah, it's a good way to describe it jumbled up. Um, and then the key itself. Look at that. It's just a human ear. As the keychain. Like, what a weird thing. And the keychain part, like the key ring, goes through the lobe of the ear like it's a piercing. It's creepy. But at the same time, I kind of love it and I want it. Like, where's my Konami official merch key ear key ring thing? Where's this? <laughs> Opens Amazon. <laughs> if you can't find any Christophonics, let me know. I know what I'm going to go into business selling. I'll sell dozens of them. Anyway. Patient wing elevator is written on the tag. It was stuck in the bath pipe. Yeah, just... Oh, there's your elevator key. Stuck on a key ring that looks like a human ear. Fished out of a pipe. Text here. There it is. I turn the handle, but no water comes out. Not the most important or exciting flavor text, but... Still try to examine everything that can be examined. Um, let's go check on Maria before we get on the elevator. Still here, sleeping on that really gross fucking mattress. <coughs> I'll be okay soon. <coughs> Did you find Laura? Still coughing up a lung. But now we can finally use the elevator. So from here, we've been all over the second floor. We've been all over the third floor uh, from, from the patient wing, but we haven't been able to get to the first floor patient wing because the door was blocked. So now we can get there via elevator. The elevator. And again, I love just this atmosphere. This is one of my favorite like atmospheric sounds from this game. The heavy breathing and that sort of distant metal clanking that really low bassy tone just sort of droning behind all of it really good just super creepy very simple but very effective no trivia trivia on the elevator is a little bit later it's not until we get back on the elevator with Maria shells and gun bullets let me look at the box of bullets hey there we go so there's the penguin penguin handgun bullets to go with our crow shotgun shells asthma's creepy I mean it's more than just that. It's it's like breathing through some sort of apparatus. Yeah, somebody on a ventilator 
or, or something similar. the rest of this before we get over there. This door is just locked. Not jammed. Go. Oh, this opens back up to the first floor. We don't need to go that way just yet. And we get this great angle as soon as we first walk into this room. You can see these teddy bears kind of in the foreground of the shot. Just sitting similar to the one that we found, identical to the one that we found the bent needle in on the second floor. You can see James, his head starts ducking down where he is looking towards something. And we find Laura. <laughs> Laura? Huh? You know my name? Eddie told me. That big fat blabbermouth. How do you know about Mary? What's the big deal? Why can't you just tell me? You gonna yell at me if I don't? No, I won't. I was friends with Mary. We met at the hospital. It was last year. You liar! Laura! I... Fine, don't believe me. But last year, Mary was already... I'm sorry, Laura. Anyway, let's go. I love how James just kind of shuts down there. Like, trying to come to terms. He can't even can fathom. We can talk about this later. He this can't, is no place for He can't kid. even process... There are all sorts of strange Mary things around being here. alive I can't a year ago. You haven't even gotten a scratch on you. Why should I? We get the why should I line, showing that Laura is perceiving wait, wait. the hospital and get. reality around Later, them differently okay. than but James. It's really important. What is it? A letter from Mary. Huh? I want to go get it. Is that okay? Yes. Yes. Is it in there? Yeah, in the back. What are you doing, Laura? It's further back in the desk. Laura! What are you doing? I love the creepy close-up of the Laura. flesh lips. What, I'm a liar, right? Want me to open it? Huh? Huh? Do ya? What's the magic word? Laura? Okay. I guess it won't open it. I think I'll just leave you like this. You snotty little brat! You fart face. I love how we see the flesh lips when they're descending during the cutscene. 
they're like hanging on to rails. There's like rods up above the, the ceiling tiles that they're holding on to with like one arm that's just popping up out of the middle of their body. Just look at that design. It's just sort of like a shapeless stained bag inside of a cage with the feet sticking out. Why did they look like the final boss? Good question. So the reason for that is because they represent the same thing. Mary. Mary lying in bed. Um, Mary being in bed, being bedridden from her illness for so long, uh, is represented in a lot of the creatures and a lot of the imagery that we see throughout the game. So we see it in both the lying figures, or the uh, flesh lips here, um, very similar to the boss form of Mary slash Maria at the very end. cage has been a bed the whole time? No, that's exactly what the cage is. It's supposed to represent a bed frame that, in a way, is also a cage. Mary couldn't leave her bed because of how severe her illness was. So, to her, it very much was a cage. that death animation it just sort of goes off and the legs just like fold up see the attack animation it just sort of chokes James with its feet sound effect, though. possible this is Laura's manifestation as well? Nope. The devs have straight up said there are no... Nothing is tied to Laura. She doesn't see manifestations and nothing is manifested from her. She just sees an empty town. Nothing is, like, created from her mind. show the difference in melee versus guns. And there is Flesh Lips number three. We still got plenty of shotgun. Time for the most directly inspired Jacob's Ladder scene in the game. James. 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 So this game and the Silent Hill games in general very heavily inspired by a lot of different media. 
a lot of different movies uh, and books and art, and all sorts of things. Um, but Jacob's Ladder is definitely one of the biggest ones. They make a lot of references to it. James himself is sort of designed after uh, Tim Robbins's character of Jacob in Jacob's Ladder. Um, they make reference to Tim Robbins, the actor who plays him, in a note in the apartments. Uh, they also make reference to Adrian Lyne, the director of Jacob's Ladder, also in the apartments. Um, there's a lot of very direct references to Jacob's Ladder for this game in particular. And that scene, that first person perspective of James like being wheeled, you can hear just the sound effects of like the, the hospital gurney that he's on. And without even showing it, just from a camera angle, you get that impression of laying on a hospital bed, staring straight up, being wheeled down a hallway, which is taken that perspective and that shot and everything. Uh, is taken from a particular scene in Jacob's Ladder. So, yeah. And then Homecoming does... Homecoming is a perfect example where you can look at this scene in Silent Hill 2 and how different it is compared to the scene that influenced it and inspired it versus Homecoming and the way that they handle their intro. It, it's a perfect example of using you know, an existing piece of media of pop culture, the, you know, a movie or something and copying it in such a way where it feels either striking and intentional for the context or just like a blatant ripoff with no subtlety. Homecoming is the blatant ripoff with no subtlety. Like it's very obvious, especially when it's already been done in a previous game in the series. Like, it's one thing to kind of copy something that closely, but it's another thing to do it when an earlier game already did that same, a scene inspired by that same thing. That seems a little bit cheap. Um, blubby face, you, you brought up the Laura is a red herring for veteran Silent Hill players, right? And then you kind of expanded on that. Uh, I feel like Nub taught me this cause I didn't play Silent Hill 1, but players coming from that game going into Silent Hill 2 don't know what's causing the manifestations through. Uh, imagine how confused they must feel. See the flesh lips attack right after Laura locks you in the room. Um, no, you're, you're actually right. Like to, to a certain degree when Silent Hill 2 was brand new, nobody knew what to expect. Um, going into it, a lot of people thought that it was going to be related to, or tied more directly to Silent Hill 1. So I wouldn't say that Laura is there specifically to be a red herring, but it's definitely sort of something for the players to think is the source of like what's going on, considering weird little girl with psychic powers was the whole focus point of Silent Hill 1, so Silent Hill 2, before anybody knew any better, you know, coming into it, having only Silent Hill 1 as your basis of comparison, you would see Laura and probably make that assumption. I'm sure a lot of players probably didn't. That, uh, you know, Laura was going to be this, this game's Alessa. But, uh, nope. They went for something much less obvious, which I think is good. <laughs> I think that I prefer that. But they went for something uh, a lot more ambiguous and not really related to the first game at all. come over here not only is there uh some supplies and things to get just to clear off the uh map as well but i wanted to come into these rooms where we start uh hearing some weird 
sound effects. There's like the glass breaking in this room. Uh, again, very similar to a audio kind of scare moment in Silent Hill 1 with the random sound of uh, glass being broken. First sign of rust and blood. I mean, we've been seeing elements of rust and blood throughout this entire game. Everything throughout Silent Hill 2, like every character is perceiving reality in a different way. James is perceiving reality in his way, which is closely associated with the death of his wife, Mary, but not just her death um, that he is responsible for, but also for everything leading up to her death, her illness. So the way that James is perceiving everything that decay, that rust, that rot is from Mary. It's it's Mary decaying and rusting and rotting that idea of things weathering over time into something, you know, disgusting, not really resembling what it once was. That is his wife, Mary, watching her succumb to her illness over the course of years and become something other than the person that, you know, he fell in love with, seeing her as this rotted, decayed uh, thing rather than kind of the wife that he married and fell in love with. So we start seeing that element in everything around him. The, the environment is all rusted and decayed and bleeding, seemingly just... It's not like there's walls that have been splattered with blood. It's like the hospital itself is bleeding. As though this is a giant living organism that we're inside of that's hemorrhaged and is full of blood, but it didn't die recently. It's been dead. So it's like blackened and looks, you know, gross and dried up. All those sort of elements sort of really come through in the environment. Like it's it's representative of Mary. It's it's what's on his mind, and the town is just taking what's in his mind and manifesting it into reality, or at least his way of perceiving reality in some way or another. <clears throat> Even stuff like this, being inside the elevator, the elevator walls are like not here. It's like these big sheets that are usually used to cover up parts of like a hospital hallway that's under construction or, or being blocked off for, you know, one reason or another. But the wrinkles in it almost look like a hand, like pressing against the fabric. Like there might be something just on the other side of it. And the fact that it's in an elevator, like you wouldn't want the elevator to be missing its solid walls. All this stuff that together kind of combines and makes everything really eerie and unsettling. Yeah, Caker Death. Uh, I, I feel like I've already talked about it earlier or in some of the other parts, but um, the same way that everyone is perceiving reality differently, Laura is no exception to that. She is not seeing what we are seeing as the player, what James is seeing. She is seeing an empty town. There's, there's nothing and nobody here, but she's not seeing the beds thrown around like this. She's not seeing the decay on the floors and she's not seeing the blood on the walls it's when i say that she doesn't see the manifestations i don't mean just the monsters i mean everything i mean all of reality the way we see it is through james's eyes we're seeing what james sees but this is not the way the town looks this is how he's perceiving it laura's seeing like an empty town that is otherwise other than being empty and devoid of people it is fine it's not dangerous. It's not old. It's not decrepit. It's not gross. You know, it's got teddy bears in it. And, you know, she's going around drawing cats on the glass in, in, in her breath and stuff like that. So, like, she's not even seeing it as being this same worn down place the way that we are seeing that, the way that James is seeing that.
uh, that's the impression that we're we're meant to to have from all of these different characters. Um, we get that idea from the first time we meet Eddie. James says, "Hey, did you see that weird pyramid, red pyramid thing?" Eddie says, "I don't know what you're talking about, but I did see weird-looking monsters." So they're both seeing monsters. Eddie's just seeing different monsters than what James is seeing. Um, we see the boss fight with Angela uh, and James fighting the abstract daddy. Before you walk into that boss fight, Angela just calls. She says, "Daddy." She's she sees it as her father. James, he doesn't see, he doesn't know Thomas Orozco. He doesn't know Angela's father, but he still sees the manifestation because it's real. It's a physical thing created by the town. These are not illusions. They're manifestations. There's a very big difference. An illusion is in your head. You see it. Nobody else sees it. Nobody else can interact with it. A manifestation is physically real. It's there. People just see it as something different or in the case of Laura, don't see it at all. Um, so James interacting with that abstract daddy, he's seeing a creature. He's seeing what Thomas Orozco represents as a person, not necessarily Thomas himself, the way that Angela is seeing him. Um, when we see Angela on the burning staircase, she sees the fire. We, as a player, get to see the fire. James doesn't see the fire. James feels the heat from it, but he doesn't see the flames. He doesn't react to the flames. He says that it's hot. He says it's hot as hell, but he doesn't see the fire. He doesn't react to flames being right next to him. Um, Angela can see that, and she says, for me, it's always like this. So for her, the same way that James sees fog and decay and rust, Angela has been seeing flames. You know, she's probably been seeing all these other elements that are more direct to her. Love the hands reaching from the bottom. I assume those are the patients put in the basement. That's a good way to interpret it. Um, part of the wallpaper is torn. I can see something drawn on the wall beneath. Are those hands searching for something or are they just a sign of pain? So they don't tell you specifically what they are. It's just creepy imagery. It's just hands reaching up. Um, it's a good visual indicator to draw your eye as a player over to this area and make you pick up key items needed to progress. We, we literally pick up a, a basement storeroom key and we also pick up the dry cell battery, which is going to be necessary for later. So it's a way of kind of forcing the player to pick things up and to draw their attention to something. Um, but I like the fact that James comments on it. Are they searching for something or are they just a sign of pain? The fact that those are the two options that James comes to, like kind of shares a little bit about his headspace. That's what he's thinking about. He's thinking about searching things. He's thinking about searching for Mary. Uh, and he's thinking about pain. He's thinking about the pain that Mary was in, the pain that he ended, the pain that he feels now because of what he did. So those are how he's looking at this and interpreting it. You're looking at it from the outside, knowing more about the patients in Brookhaven in general and interpreting that as like the patients that were put into the basement or the basement's basement, um, which we'll read about here. So that's one of the interesting things about these games. You have so many visual, striking visual elements like that, that, can cause you to kind of theorize and and wonder about something and there is no definitive answer. It's the stuff that has definitive answers that is not l like vague things that have, you know, set in stone answers. I, I like that aspect and that's a big part of why I play these games and research them is to try to learn as many of those things uh, about these games as there are, all the things that have true definitive answers about them. But there are still so, so, so many things in the Silent Hill games that are just not meant to be observed that way. You're not supposed to know what they mean. You're you're meant to interpret them in different ways. That's what really makes the difference with this series compared to a lot of other horror out there is 
that fine line between very deep, meaningful symbolism that has definitive answers for like what something means or represents and things that are like creepy and weird with no real reason behind it, you know, that is left up to your interpretation and sort of wandering back and forth on that line because you kind of wind up playing that little metagame. Like, is this something significant? And if it is significant, is it significant only to me or is it significant to the character to the context of the story. Um, anyway, so now we've got this note. Speaking of the hands reaching up from the basement, it's right next to this note, which is why I like that theory um, that you brought up, uh, dropped at it. Um, I was locked up inside the basement's basement. It was so small and dark, and I was so afraid. I dropped my precious ring, but I will never, ever go back there. So someone, one of the patients, had a precious ring, dropped it in the basement's basement where they were locked up. Gives us an idea of something to look for. Yeah, the way they call it precious ring. I wonder if that's a Lord, Lord of the Rings reference. Poor Gollum. They had him imprisoned. Isn't that what that new horrible golem game that just came out is about? So we went through and looked at everything in Brookhaven Hospital. You can see now everything is like unchecked again since we're in like the other world version of Brookhaven now. So we're going to go through and recheck every single door. animation where they stand back up. A lot of care really went into the uh, the enemy animations and stuff here. And that is one thing that's worth talking about since I'm bringing it up. Uh, how much I like the nurse animations and the pyramid head animations. A lot of those were not mo-capped. So they they blew all the mocap budget essentially on mocapping the main characters so of course you have Guy C performing all the motions and voice for James Sunderland, Monica Horgan doing voice and motion for Mary and Maria um, Dave Shoffley for Eddie Jacqueline Breckenridge for uh, uh, Laura Donna Burke for Angela so you have all these main characters, but then you've also got all these enemies, Pyramid Head and the nurses and stuff. Like, what about their motions, their mo, their animations, animotions, animo caps? Um, and a lot of them were not mo capped. They were animated by members of the team. Some of them by Ito himself. Just uh, as a way, you know, because they couldn't afford to mo cap absolutely everything in the game. And they still move and look great for like hand done animation as opposed to mocap data. Especially for very humanoid looking things like Pyramid Head and the nurses. Hey, look, here's everyone's least favorite thing about the Enhanced Edition. I've legitimately seen people complain about the Enhanced Edition. I should point out I love the Enhanced Edition. I think it's great. I don't think it's perfect. There's definitely some things that are altered and tweaked a little bit compared to the original, but 
for the most part, I understand why it is done that way. And I still think this is by and far like one of the best possible ways to play and experience the original Silent Hill 2. Um, and I've seen people complain about stuff with the enhanced edition because of like this. See this little cord wire where the fridge that's in the middle of the floor like looks like it continues and is plugged into something. That was added. That's not there in the original. So to some fans, that means this is a horrible abomination and an inexcusable, terrible port, unplayable for Silent Hill 2. Because the Enhanced Edition developers dared to sully the work of the glorious gods that are Team Silent and add a power cable to to a refrigerator. <laughs> Weird, but like, okay. I agree. It's, it's not... It doesn't bother me that it's there and it definitely doesn't bother me that it's not. I don't know, but there are legitimately some fans that are that are like, oh, I hate this game. I hate this port of it because they change things like this. Like, really? Really? That? That bothers you? There's something that looks like a refrigerator. Will you open it? Love the exasperated sigh from James. Hmm. It's no good. The door is too heavy to open by myself. We'll have to come back with a friend. Can't stop seeing it. I know, now that I've brought it to your attention. Every time you're watching someone play Silent Hill 2 during this part, look for the cable. Look for the refrigerator cable. Meanwhile, people still praising. That's the thing, too. It's it's like there's probably a lot of the same people. There's going to be some crossover. There's probably some people out there where they'll complain about this kind of stuff when it comes to the Enhanced Edition. But when it comes to the HD collection, they'll still be like, eh, it's okay. It's not as bad as people say it is. There's probably some crossover. The HD collection isn't as bad as most people say it is. It's worse. See, I agree with that statement. That's that's a little closer to the truth than what a lot of people seem convinced of. But hey, there's also not really. You can't just go and buy the original Silent Hill 2 anywhere. So I can't blame people for having to play. Like if you have to play Silent Hill and you don't have any other way to play it. For a lot of people, that means HD collection is your only option. Can't do nothing about that. Sit here and hope that one of these days Konami will uh, release the rest of the games, the originals, in a collection or PC ports or something. They put Silent Hill 4 on good old games. Why not 2 and 3? Why not two and three? They both have functioning PC versions. And fans have already done the hard part about like modding them to work on modern so like hardware. So why Silent Hill 4 gets good old games treatment and not two and three? Was HD collection more tolerable on PC rather than console? It didn't come out on PC. HD collection was only on console. It was only on PS3 and 360. The PC versions are like originals. They're they're some of the first ports. So Silent Hill 1 was only ever on PlayStation 1. It never got a port onto anything. I mean, digitally onto PS3, but you know what I mean. Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3, Silent Hill 4, 
back when they first came out, they all got PC ports within about a year of the console versions coming out. So they like that's what I'm playing right now is the PC version of Silent Hill 2, the original PC version of Silent Hill 2, just with the enhanced edition mod on top of it. But yeah, HD collection was only on PS3 and 360. And technically the 360 version was worse because they never patched it. And it doesn't really matter because it's still a mess. Even if you play a patched version on PS3, the patch barely did anything. It's still a horrible mess of a game. Terrible, terrible versions of Silent Hill 2 and 3. Anyway. We gotta we gotta break this conversation. I've done a whole gigantic explanation and playthrough of the HD collection. It's archived here on Twitch. I need to get it over on YouTube because the, the video file is too big. It's like 14 hours long. Um, but yeah. It's archived here on Twitch. If you, if you want to watch me go through the HD collection and talk about everything, every little thing that's horrible and wrong about it, you can go do that. Today we're going to talk about Silent Hill 2. The good version. Just some doodle. Huh, something is written on it. She is an angel. No one knows. Only I can see the lady of the door. Uh, again, style of writing matching other notes that we find. So this very, very closely fits the writing that we saw on the uh, typewriter. She's an angel no one knows. Only I can see the lady of the door. They cannot walk along her bridge of thread. They fall from the weight of their crimes. Like bloated and ugly corpses. Their sins, she devours them. Sin and sinner alike. She saves me. She is an angel. Is this the version of 2 on the HD collection? No. Starting to not understand some of these questions. The version of 2 on the HD collection. The HD collection is its own sort of bastard versions of 2 and 3. Using unfinished source code. This is the actual retail release PC version of the game with enhanced edition mods thrown on top. HD collection is its own horrible train wreck. Anyway, like I said, go watch the HD collection video if you want more information on that. We're not playing that today. We're not talking about that today. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Would you include maps in a new Silent Hill game? Why would you remove maps? People... People are still going to want to know where they're going while they play the video game. In the game called Silent Hill, where they wander around the town called Silent Hill? Having a map would still be really nice. Why would you remove them? let alone ask why would I include them? I don't understand anymore. Am I having a stroke? Am I, um, just not understanding chat any longer? Do you smell toast? Yeah. Smell honey butter honey toast. There's a painting of a woman on the door. Oddly enough, the hand part of the painting is actually 3D and sticks out. It breaks the immersion of looking at a map while wandering around. Um, maybe to a certain degree, especially if you're if you use the map the way I tend to. And I tend to do this with casual playthroughs, and then I've started doing it again with these in-depth playthroughs. Um, I like to show the map a lot, and I like to look at the map a lot. I, I like to double-check that the things that I'm investigating are being, like, marked. Like, every door that I check is being marked off. 
every pathway that I've tried is being marked somehow so that I can refer back to it when I'm wandering around inevitably looking for, you know, an item I forgot or a health drink that I need or something like that. Like right now, I can't remember. Did I check this door or did I check this door? Which was the last one? So it was this one. So I'm, you know, I look at the map a lot just to verify stuff. And yeah, they, they bring up a good point. Nobody forces you to, to look at the map. If you don't like breaking your immersion, stopping and looking at it, you don't have to. You don't actually have to. The way it is in older games, maybe uh, if it's while we see the character actually holding a map. Oh, like newer games, you'll just have like a mini map on the screen. And it'll either be part of the UI or it'll be something that's worked into like, oh, your character has like Silent Hill Shattered Memories. Great example. Silent Hill Shattered Memories. You use your cell phone. Your cell phone is the map. But when it comes to like the Silent Hill 2 remake, which I, is what I assume you're kind of hinting at, even though you didn't really say specifically, but uh, maps, I think, have a big part. They're, they're an important part of these types of games. It would be weird if they weren't in it. This room? Yeah, dude, this room. So I wanted to make it to this room because this is the room where Maria was. This is where we, we left Maria to, to rest on the nasty bed. And she was popping pills to recover from her quote unquote hangover. And now we get this very intense breathing, especially, you know, headphones on moment. If you're if you're watching this on your TV speakers, it probably doesn't come across as good as when you're wearing headphones. You've got like a really good sound system to hear this breathing um, and the way that it sort of shifts between channels it sounds very close. Um, there are empty medicine bottles here. Is this what Maria was taking? So he starts questioning the medication that Maria took out when she started feeling ill. And he follows that up with, is Maria sick now too? Not just, is Maria sick? Is Maria sick now too? So he's already drawing that mental comparison. He's making that comparison of Mary and Maria. That Mary, you know was his wife who fell ill and he's had to suffer through all of this because of it. And now Maria, this other person who looks almost exactly like his wife, who now starts showing similar symptoms and illnesses and using medication. So James is being forced to compare the two and through doing that starts coming to terms with the truth of what happened to Mary via Maria. Maria's not here. Where could she have gone? This also has now become like one of the cleanest rooms in all of Brookhaven. Like it's still not great. It's still pretty gross, but compared to even just how it looked the first time we were here. It's like cleaned up a little bit. Kind of stands out. It's a lot more white than, uh, with the, the sheets and stuff and the cleaner tiles, like compared to out here where everything's more of a dingy off-white or yellow. I love how some of these areas, there's just not doors at all. Just like walls, sheets hanging on the walls. <clears throat> if I had the talent to do video essays, I'd do full four hours on the soundscapes of the Team Silent Era games. Oh, I could talk about just the audio from all of the games. Um, I could do an entire series just about that. And I probably will at some point. But right now, I'm still, like, not good at editing. Like, I've gotten pretty used to streaming over the years, but I'm not good at video editing. 
So it's a lot harder for me to do laid out like video essays that are structured and stuff like that just because I don't know how to I don't know how to make them look and and sound and feel the way I want them to. useful here. Rock and shells, first aid kit, handgun bullets, those are all useful things. Nothing else useful here. We'll be back to this little storage room. Uh, I just wanted to visit it early. We get not only some supplies here, but just to kind of show for comparison, we'll, uh, there will be something else in this room when we revisit later. Special treatment does not show up, or doesn't open. Pressing the buttons, the elevator does not move. That's kind of everything that we can do there. Um, let's go up before we go down. Lock is broken. Path is blocked. That's as far as that goes. Have you ever showed the Brookhaven track that plays when you're one shot? Yes. In fact, it, it the game sets it up for you to hear that track very easily. Because almost every playthrough will show it. You just have to listen for it. After you get knocked off the roof by Pyramid Head, uh, your health is brought down to one. And you're not one shot away from death. You're two, two hits away from death. But it's enough still to, uh, to change the music. But it's not, it's not like a difficult thing to discover. Most people do it by accident. Just because you're always damaged at that point. And if you play this game the first time, you might not even realize that you're damaged. Basement storeroom key. Uh, oh yeah, there was a... This right here, this is masterwork and sound design. Yeah, so going downstairs, hearing that squeal. Um, that squeal, for example, is a baby crying. And it is just really sped up. It's like really sped up and pitched up to make that um, really creepy squeal sound, almost like a pig or a rat or something. Um, but you can't quite place it because it's not an animal. It's a, it's a baby. It's a baby crying. Just really, really fast. Really, really high pitch. <clears throat> and there's a lot of things kind of in the Silent Hill series where, the, where they did sound effects by speeding up something that's, you know, like an animal noise or... Uh, just something unexpected in general. Hell, Silent Hill 1 has the famous dentist drill. There's a shelf here. There are red handprints on the shelf. Move it. Not even just the creation of that sound, but how the use of it, how it's set there to activate on motion, but only once, and so quiet, it's possible to think you heard something else, something not in the game at all. I agree. And if you also then compare it to, like, the HD collection, for example, that sound effect is broken. It doesn't play correctly. It plays at the wrong speed. It plays at the wrong pitch. And it will just continually loop on a much faster, like, time than it's supposed to so like here we hear that squeal just once while just kind of walking towards the door normally if you stuck around and hung out out there for like a few more seconds you would hear it loop back again whereas on the hd collection you just hear it constantly it plays it ends there's like a second and then it plays 
over and over. So those are little things that like somebody playing Silent Hill for the first time, you would never know. You'd never notice because it's just a sound effect thing. And people say that that kind of thing does not detract from the game in any kind of meaningful way. I wholeheartedly disagree. It throws off everything. The ambiance, the the actual like moment of a scare, depending on how it syncs up with a particular sound, like messing those sounds up using the wrong sounds, playing them at the wrong speeds. It messes up the feel of a scene or of a part of the game. And there's tons of things like that. Tons of little things like that. And the majority of it is things that if you were completely brand new, never seen Silent Hill, never played it before, and you were just trying to enjoy it for your first time, you'd play the HD collection and you would probably say it wasn't as bad as everyone said it was because all these horrible little mistakes and problems with it, you wouldn't even notice. You wouldn't, you don't have anything to compare it to. So you wouldn't realize that the sounds are all jacked up and making a scene not give off the same feeling as it originally did. I don't know. It sucks. Why do we keep talking about HD collection? We're not playing HD collection. <laughs> we keep circling back to this. It needs to stop. Fuck's sake. Let's talk to Maria. Let's see Maria be all pissed off and start showing some of her going back and forth between Maria personality stuff and Mary uh, personality aspects. James. Mary? Oh, Maria. It's you. I thought you were... Sorry. Anyway, I'm glad you're alive. Anyway? What do you mean, anyway? You don't sound very happy to see me. I was almost killed back there. Why didn't you try to save me? All you care about is that dead wife of yours. I've never been so scared in my whole life. You couldn't care less about me, could you? No, I just... Then stay with me. Don't ever leave me alone. You're supposed to take care of me. <laughs> so, what about Laura? Did you find her? Yeah, but she ran away. We've got to find her. You really seem to care about her. Do you know her? I've never met her before. I just feel sorry for her. She's all alone. And for some reason, I feel like it's up to me to protect her. So that's a really important bit of dialogue and a really great scene. First off, just from the performance, the cinematography of it, um, the pre-render coming back into the gameplay there and getting that that interaction between James and Maria. Um, Maria sort of recognizing that James is not really caring about her as much as she thought he would. Um, James showing how one-track mind he is, focused on finding Mary. He doesn't really care about Maria. He doesn't really care about Laura sort of tolerating them and putting up with them, but they are secondary to what he's doing. And he kind of lets that show there. Maria, like, on the one hand, she has some of Mary's um, feelings and memories, but this is where we get the idea that she's slowly regaining those memories over the course of the game. She doesn't remember everything. She, does, she knows that she cares for Laura. And... Mary being in the hospital with Laura being one of her only friends for like more than a year. Uh, so much so to the point where she got close enough to Laura where she says that she would have adopted her if not for her illness, if things had been better. So she really, really cared about her. The Laura and Mary were extremely close. And that feeling of attachment is still there in Maria's mind from Mary's, you know, memories of and feelings towards Laura. But she doesn't remember who she is. She says she never met her. She could be putting that on as an act, you know, just towards James. But I don't get the impression that that's what she's doing here. The same way that Born from a Wish ends and she kind of realizes who she is and what she's doing. 
at the time where she first meets James um, and kind of teases him about, you know, do I look like your girlfriend? All that kind of stuff. She's aware of what she's doing there. But when it comes to this, like, I genuinely believe she's telling the truth there, that she doesn't remember Laura specifically, but she still feels that strong attachment because of, you know, her, her past life, essentially, as Mary. Um, so we get a good back and forth. We, we see Maria sort of showing her anger, uh, getting pissed off at James for his little anyway, what do you mean anyway? That anyway from James showing how James really does not really care, like doesn't, doesn't care that much about Maria and, uh, about Laura. He's sort of focused on what he's doing. Um, and the idea of Maria sort of slowly regaining these memories, remembering how she feels about Laura or how Mary felt about Laura, but not sure why. We've made it to the hospital's basement, the basement's basement that was written about in that note earlier and uh, found a copper ring found it in the basement of the hospital engraved with a picture of a spider. So this was that uh, precious ring that the patient uh, earlier wrote about. Maria. <laughs> Yeah, it's Maria. Or if uh, you're Mary Elizabeth McLynn, who voices uh, Mary and Maria in the HD collection, in an interview, she, she refers to the character as Marie. Just to make it even more confusing. And we're once again talking about HD collection. That's my own fault for bringing that up. Marie. I do the voice for Mary and Marie. But now we can Continue on to the rest of Brookhaven with Maria by our side. And there was that refrigerator that we couldn't open by ourselves. that was on the second floor. We're going to head back down to floor two. And one of the most Amazing yet bizarre sequences in this game. Such innocent lives. 
What was the name of the murderer who committed this vile act? One, Walter Sullivan. Two, Scott Fairbanks. Three, Eric Gaines. Now for our third and final question. South of the lake is a deserted old neighborhood called South Vale. From there to Pale Vale, the central resort area northwest of the lake, there's only one road you can take. Just one road, no more. The third and final question is, what is the name of that road? One, Bachman Road. Two, Rindell Street. Three, Nathan Avenue. Well, that's the last of our questions. Have you got it all figured out? When you know the answers, head to the storeroom on the third floor to collect your prizes. But be careful if you're wrong. <laughs> well then, everybody, thanks for tuning in. See you again sometime. Bye-bye. What was that? So, Navi Ryamar in chat, you you put, I've never understood this part of the game. It seems really out of place. It's appropriate because Maria is in this game and it seems out of place to her too because that's just anybody's reaction after all of that. What was that? Like, what in the actual fuck was that? Suddenly just game show host? Trivia questions, like in the middle of my other world psychological horror masterpiece? Yes. And I think it's an important thing. And I think... So how would you feel about questions being new and randomized in the remake? Um, I would be totally fine with that. I would be surprised if the remake includes this sequence at all. This is one of the things that I feel like Bloober Team has a lot of trouble with in their games. They struggle with a lot of pacing and with horror, like horror is especially difficult to pace correctly because if things are just genuinely terrifying, all these horrible monsters and sounds and atmosphere and everything, if it's like that constantly all the time, you become desensitized to it as a player and it doesn't bother you anymore. When, when you see one nurse after a long, you know, scary hallway with a lot of loud noises and banging going on and it's set up properly and it's lit properly it becomes like really scary when you're sitting in a hallway and you've just murdered eight other nurses doing that same trick that same music that same lighting that same atmosphere isn't going to affect you and scare you anymore so sometimes you have to put something else in you have to sort of relieve some of the tension so that you can build it back up again, build it back on something new. So what we're seeing is a break in the tension that's been going on since you entered Brookhaven, which, you know, we've been in here for two and a half hours. So you get a little bit of a break from that tension that you've become used to, and you get a little bit of levity. You get a little bit of relief. You get a what the fuck moment. You might even get a laugh or a giggle from the silly voice and Maria's reaction. And that's really important because that little giggle or that little laugh or that little what the fuck is pulling you out of all of that, you know, really heavy atmosphere and tension that they've been building up. And it lets them build it back up again. So it's it's really important, I think. It is just kind of a goofy little moment to kind of add a little bit of levity. Um, but I don't think Bloober Team would see how critical and important something like, something like that is. And I could see them removing that from the remake, thinking that it is just a weird moment that doesn't fit, that doesn't match the rest of the tone of the game. Which it doesn't, but I think that's the point. That's why it has to be in there. Think the game show announcer is the same entity, same voice on the radio and PT? Nope, I don't think those are related in any way whatsoever. Literally nothing to draw that conclusion from other than it is a disembodied voice. That's what we like to call thinking about things a little bit too hard. 
And it's fun to do that as a thought experiment to like think about connections that might or might not be there sometimes because sometimes it's a good way to discover actual real information with these games but no, I don't think there's any connection there. Kojima was going very specifically out of his way to make PT like not related to anything else and anyway we're not here to talk about PT or we're talking about Silent Hill 2 and there's something that looks like a refrigerator and now with the power of two human beings, or at least one human being and a manifestation that resembles the human being, we're gonna open it. You can't open it? Yeah, Maria, give me a hand here. Come on, you're supposed to be the big man around here. How's a little girl like me supposed to help? <clears throat> What's this? Not very cute, is it? Here, James. You take it. Mm, thanks. One of the best line deliveries in the game. Guarantee you. That line will not be in the remake, or it will definitely not be as good. Hmm, <laughs> thanks. Again, little goofy moments of levity. Maybe that's the best take they had. Maybe that's not the best take they could have gotten, but... It's become one of my favorite things in this game after thousands of hours of playing, so there must be something to it. Love it. I love how Maria just kind of plays it off, like, it's not very cute, you take this, because clearly it's needed for a puzzle, not for wearing, not for style, not, not part of the drip. Uh, and it is also made of lead, so that's not good. Lead ring. Ring from the refrigerator. It's engraved with a disgusting, bloated face. Like barely a face. Just some sunken in parts for eyes. A little extended part for a nose. Oh, excuse me. Barely a little indentation there for like a mouth. But no more definition than that. Completely forgot Silent Hill 2 Remake means new voice actors. Yeah, James and Mary slash Maria have already been cast. Like, we already know who they are. Lock is broken. Has Bluebird ever adapted another IP before? Uh, Blair Witch. And I don't think they did a great job with it either, so... Yeah. So we've got the... 3D hands. I love how that's how James describes it. It's a painting of a woman on the door. The hand part of the painting is 3D. It sticks out. We use our copper and lead ring. Put the lead ring and the copper ring on the hand of the lady in the painting. And the door opens. I do just like this artwork. See, this this sort of thing, which makes just as much sense as, you know, random radio show announcer, but by this point, you're sort of, like, accustomed to seeing weird, nonsensical shit in Silent Hill, so it can be very easy to just kind of move on and not really take in, like, okay, it's this, like, old-timey painting of Fancy, wealthy women. But specifically, this part around the door has the hands sticking out. Just a really neat, striking image. And again, there's, there's a lot of different things you could potentially infer from it, but nothing that it really tells you, like, directly. 
Uh, we find a note on the ground. The handwriting is hard to read. So again, that same patient that was writing and misspelling things, um, wrote the typewriter stuff, wrote the, um, these other notes that we've been coming across, also wrote this. Took the director's key, the one to the museum. I hid it behind the praying woman when I went out for the day trip. I picked it up, but I did not steal it. I'm not a criminal. I love all the little intentional misspellings and stuff with this. So the key to the museum. They're referring to the Silent Hill Historical Society. And that's going to be where we're headed to next, because we're pretty much done with Brookhaven. All we have to do now is leave. And I'm sure nothing will go wrong trying to do that. I love how these camera angles already kind of clue you in. Like the rest of the hospital has kind of looked a certain way and felt a certain way up until this point. And then you get to the, the door in the basement after all this, and you sort of have this long... There's no music. There's nothing else. It's just sort of this front-on camera angle. Then you get the music kicking in. Just that little bit of sound effect, that metal impact noise. And there he is. And Maria just chilling right next to him. This is your one opportunity to like stall him and get ahead of him. Because just like before, you can't kill Pyramid Head. Leave her alone. Leave us both the hell alone. We'll just walk casually to the elevator. It's fine. Just like that, Maria is gone. Pyramid Head just shows up. James and Maria feel, you know, feeling like they're done with Brookhaven, about to escape and, and move on from here. And Pyramid Head says, nope. Starts chasing you down. Especially if you're playing on hard mode, that part can be really difficult to get through because um, you have to make time. Like if you're playing on easy or normal, you can just run through there and get through it fast enough without Maria getting killed by Pyramid Head too early before you make it to the elevator. Um, on hard mode, you do kind of have to... He gets very fast and does a lot more damage. Maria dies more easily, so you do have to stop and shoot at him to stall him during that one uh, chain link wall section. 
Um, but imagine going through all that, especially if you play on hard mode the first time, and making all this effort to stall Pyramid Head and get away from him, and then Maria's just dead. She's just gone. There's nothing you can do about it. This hurt a lot the, when you played the first time. Same. And that piano music is just perfect. Like, that piano accompaniment to that scene and following up that scene is is perfect for kind of driving that feeling home. Books about medicine, the town, and the region are lined up here. I don't have the time to stand around reading all this. Yeah, we do. I have all that, all the time in the world. This creepy painting over here next to the lamp. A lot of these like abstract paintings where you kind of look at it and you're like, ah, oh, it's just some kind of weird flesh abstract, you know, design. But there's like faces and stuff mixed in with it. It's uh it's pretty gross. Pretty disturbing. I love love all those little details for things that are just sort of off off to the side. You don't even need to pay it any attention, but it's there. There's an old book here about the history of Silent Hill. Sadly, specifically to break my heart, James does not read it. This looks great on the Enhanced Edition. I, I love being able to see all these little details, bits of text on this. Um, the Toluca Boat Launch, the Lakeview Hotel, Scenic Views and Lifelong Memories, Sanford Street, Paleville. So it even shows, you know, that section of Silent Hill that's called, that neighborhood that's called uh, Paleville. Uh, the correct location, Sanford Street. Toluca Boat Launch, Marina Bay Limited, 10 years of business. The Toluca Lake Boat Club. Enjoy the boating life without the responsibility. Boats, pontoons, canoes, and more. Join the club. Start boating today. I'm sold. Toluca Tours is that one on the top right. Daily tours of scenic Toluca Lake. And the boat that it's showing a picture of we see later. It's similar to the, um, the Little Baroness, which is a ship that went out onto Toluca and vanished. Uh which is, we get a little bit more information about that uh, and the little barrenness and its disappearance later in Silent Hill 2 is just kind of like a little side thing in another note in the prison area. Um, but for any of you who have ever played or seen the Silent Hill arcade game, uh, the arcade game is based entirely around the little barrenness disappearance. So it's cool that they have that included on, like, the map of the town. There's, like, a little thing there for the tours of the lake. Kind of showing that. You can see Paleville, uh, the north side of Silent Hill, where Lakeview Hotel, the amusement park. Um, there's a little, a few streets to the right-hand side. Um, east of the Lakeside Amusement Park, where... You can see little a little area. That's one of the spots you were in in Silent Hill 1. Is that little area on the far right side of uh, Sanford Street. And a little further north from that way. Of course the Lakeview Hotel which we'll be going to later. You can see even on the lake there's some land. There's like a little island in between Rosewater Park and the Lakeview Hotel. Um, which... We uh, do see a little bit of that. That is, there's a little island with a little church on it. It's used in the rebirth ending, which unfortunately we won't be seeing on this playthrough. But if you've seen the rebirth ending, you can see that, uh, that little island, that little church. He who is not bold enough to be stared at from across the abyss is not bold enough to stare into it himself. The truth can only be learned by marching forward. Keep going forward. Follow the map. There's a letter and a wrench. We have the map showing us where to get the wrench over on Lindsay Street. Uh, 
and where to go and dig up the key, which is in Rosewater Park. James copies that onto his own map. There's the letter and the wrench. And there is Rosewater Park. And that will give us the key to the Silent Hill Historical Society, which is the last thing that he uh, underlines. The hospital lobby key so that we can leave Brookhaven. Laura outside walking around in this like pitch black void no problem because to her it's not a pitch black void like everything is entirely different for laura she's not seeing the same you know run down nightmare town that that we are seeing through james he's walking around no problem no issue get our piano track once again coming back out here I can't remember if the uh, piano music, like the, the glitch works on Enhanced Edition or not. So on the PC version of this game, and in fact on a few different versions of this game, whenever you're leaving Brookhaven, um, you can quick turn and come back in and then quick turn and go back out and essentially bug the music trigger for this piano uh, song so that it keeps playing when you're outside of the hospital. As it's definitely not supposed to. But I can't remember if that glitch works on Enhanced or not. We'll try it in a second. Use the hospital lobby key. Maria's dead. I couldn't protect her. And Laura has run off somewhere. Once again, I couldn't do anything to help. Mary, what should I do? Are you really waiting somewhere for me? Or is this your way of taking... He doesn't quite say revenge, but he almost got there. I'm going to find Mary. It's the only thing I have left to hope for. So again, every step of the way, as we're going through this game, James is breaking through his delusion. The reality of what, what happened to Mary, what he's responsible for doing, and how it has impacted his life... It's just clawing away at him. And every once in a while, it gets a little bit closer to the surface. And we see that in that, that line of thinking there. Um, he says, Mary, is this your way of taking? And just sort of trails off. Similar to the way he trailed off when Laura was like, yeah, me and Mary were friends. That was last year. And James blows up and calls her a liar. And he starts to say, you know, last a year ago, Mary was already... And he doesn't quite say dead. He just sort of trails off. It's that it's his brain trying to come to terms with this delusion, this false reality that he's sort of become overwhelmed by and the truth of what actually happened. So great dialogue there. Um, oh, and just because I didn't talk about it before, since we're playing the enhanced edition, um, the Brookhaven Hospital sign is corrected. It specifically does say Brookhaven Hospital on it. In the original release for Silent Hill 2, um, this says Brookhaven. Common thing with uh, Japanese being translated to English. R's and L's get uh, interchanged for a lot of words and a lot of uses. So if you're playing the original version of Silent Hill 2, this will say Blookhaven. If you're playing Enhanced Edition, or if you're playing uh, the HD collection, um, it'll say Brookhaven. And same thing for Silent Hill 3. When you revisit this uh, Brookhaven Hospital in Silent Hill 3, they fix the sign by the time they get to 3. So 3 also says Brookhaven. Just a weird little mistake in the original. that uh, the Enhanced Edition went out of its way to, to fix.
I love the appearance of the the town like going around at night. There's something about it's essentially the same effect, the the fog and the darkness, but there's something about the darkness effect, this ambient music, just the combination of all of it, the flashlight kind of cutting through all these dark areas. It gives it a very different feeling than wandering around in the fog. Going to Heaven's Night. Damn. Lock is broken. Can't be opened. Hey, what's updating? Hope you're doing well tonight. Nurses wandering around outside are no longer like the the sort of cleaner, whiter looking ones. They're all rotted and decayed. They have this bleeding, you know, rusted texture texture over them now. And uh, they're stronger. They hit harder and take more hits to, uh, to kill compared to the other nurses. I just want to see if I can get this audio glitch... Hey, there it is. So yeah, little little audio glitch there. It still works in Enhanced Edition. But if you uh, quickly enter and then exit Brookhaven after uh, beating it, you can get this piano track to start playing again while you're outside wandering around. So if you really want a different feeling while you're walking around the town at night. the fog clear a small bit um technically there isn't any more fog when it's night even though it is also kind of the same effect just colored and shadowed differently I like just just like before I like poking around the town there's a lot of new supplies and things to pick up but things are also different a lot of places and things around the town the way they looked before are very different looking at night like this the heck is this supposed to be there's like sh something in there big rocks but because of like the the plant and the opening in this with the mesh it's almost like a bird nest like a gigantic nest a dragon nest again just these weird almost abstract sort of surreal visuals and I think a lot of that comes from their film inspirations. A lot of David Lynch, um, Alejandro Jodorowsky. Um, 
um, Alejandro Jodorowsky, David Lynch, a lot of those, uh, again, Jacob's Ladder, sort of strange, unusual imagery. Like how much of the town is covered up with these tarps. It just feels very strange and unnatural. And they use this uh, same, or at least a similar kind of effect in Silent Hill 3. You don't get to see as much of the town in 3, but there are some segments where, while you're exploring, you're kind of seeing these buildings with um, tarps and, and scaffolding and stuff sort of framing it. similarities between Silent Hill, Silent Hill 2 and Twin Peaks. And more than just Twin Peaks. Like, Twin Peaks for sure, but a, a lot of stuff that David Lynch worked on. The iconic siren uh, and, and air raid siren kind of signifying transitions to the other world that's used for most of the games. That comes from uh, David Lynch Industrial Symphony Number 1. So, a lot deeper cuts than just, like, Twin Peaks and Eraserhead and a lot of stuff that like David Lynch has done that most people know. Some of his like more obscure stuff had like very direct, very real impacts on uh, on the Silent Hill games and on Team Silent when they were developing them. And more than just Lynch, I said, there's Stephen King, um, David Lynch, a Adrian Lyne, Alejandro Jodorowsky, the list goes on and on and on. There's so many different majorly influential, you know, horror authors and directors and everything that uh, influenced the devs. We should be able to see some really fast mandarins. So there's a creature here that gets introduced uh, called the Mandarin. It's essentially what becomes the closer in uh, Silent Hill 3. But because of the enhanced edition, like we can see a little bit further than we're supposed to. And sometimes you can see them uh, going very, very fast. And I kind of want to see if we can catch that. Oh, there it is. Look at the one in the background. Look at him go. Look at him speed away. One of my favorite creature designs, that uh, that Mandarin, and uh, especially in Silent Hill 3, they they repurpose the model and use it again for a uh, creature in Silent Hill 3, but they change up, they give it new animations where it's walking around above ground and it just somehow makes it even worse, even creepier. But yeah, I, I love that enemy design. Once again, the motorhome, we were here in the very beginning of the game. Two streams ago. Um, same memo, Bar Neely's, same uh, save point, nothing new here. How much do they change them from two to three? It's very slight. There's like some tiny little differences in the model itself. 
Uh, I think just to accommodate for some of the animations where they extend their arms and stuff like that, they kind of changed some of the uh, the designs on the the Mandarin's arms when they changed them into closers for Silent Hill 3. But they're very distinct, like very distinctly similar, I should say. It's mostly their animations. It's mostly that they're walking around above ground. They have different attack animations. Different movement animations. But the model is practically identical. Yeah, the proportions are slightly changed. And again, I think that's just accommodating for their new animations in 3. We're just going to kind of wander around, look at the town, look at how different it is. When everything is kind of shifted over to night. Oh, we've also picked up some rifle ammo. If I can show you. The owl, it was owl, not hawk. I thought it was different. But there's the there's the last of our bird bullet collection. So the handgun, penguin bullets, the uh, shotgun, the crow shells, and uh, the rifle shells with an owl on them. I don't know what's the significance of those particular birds. It's just a neat detail that I noticed. That all the all the gun ammo has birds on it. Sir, this is a Wendy's. This is a happy burger. Even better than Wendy's. I mean, just look, 99 cent sandwiches. And now you got me wanting Wendy's. And it is entirely too late at night for that. It's unfair. It's unfair and I won't have it. Speed, fuel, core. Absolutely no parking in driveway and basic things. Get Whataburger. I live a minimum of two states away from the nearest Whataburger. Kick him right in the fucking crotch. What is wrong with you, James? Why are you like this? Here's uh, the Gonzalez Mexican restaurant. We looked at this at the very start of the playthrough as well. I think. Because, yeah, this is right at the very beginning of the game, in case you don't recognize where we're at. This is the blood stains that you first see, where you first James first notices the lying figure walking off this way. Let's, uh, let's go back this way and sort of retrace our steps leading into the town as far as we can. Because we haven't been back to this part of the game in quite some time. Yeah, it doesn't let you go very far. 
All this is still blocked off. That is still blocked off. Look at the, the lighting hitting those posters. And yeah, here is this. You can see the street sign on the other side of the wall. That the area where you ran into town at the very start of the game is just a solid wall now. It's not like the gate that opens up or anything. It's like completely walled off. Nurses and lying figures just absolutely everywhere. I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration. There's not that many, realistically. As big as these roads are, you have so much room to kind of wander and not even worry about them, but a lot more than there were previously. So we've got our letter and wrench from Silent Hill Brookhaven. Um, they gave us a clue to come here and look for this. And here is the letter. And we're starting to get into the part of the game where things start becoming more abstract. Like, it's already been very strange and messed up and surreal up to this point. But now reality starts breaking down like even further, where seemingly the town itself is communicating to James. Uh, in a way, it's kind of James's own subconscious just being manifested into things in the town and then coming back to him. But it's interesting to start seeing reality break down even further and, and see almost like fourth wall breaking stuff that is directed specifically to James. Uh, so we find this letter, or perhaps you are a fool. The truth usually betrays people. A part of that abyss is in the old society. The key to the society is in the park. At the foot of the praying woman, inside of the ground, inside of a box, you open it, I need a wrench. My patient buried it there. So we're reading this from the perspective of one of the doctors at Brookhaven that was caring for, like, Joseph. My patient buried it there. I knew but did nothing. It made me uneasy to have such a thing near. I wasn't looking for the truth. I was looking for tranquility. I also saw that thing. I fled, but the museum was sealed as well. Now no one dares to approach that place. So this also mentions the museum and being locked. That, of course, is the historical society, our next place of interest. If you still do not wish to stop, James, I pray to the Lord to have mercy on your eternal soul. So that's where it starts taking a turn. Now we have elements, this letter, found in this random part of the town with notes to find it from Brookhaven, from doc written by doctors we've never met, you know. And suddenly, they're directly addressing James. If you don't wish to stop, James, pray to the Lord to have mercy on your eternal soul. Again, I think this is more a case of James's own subconscious being, con you know, concerned for himself um, and sort of that worry being picked up by the town's power, manifested into things like this letter that still are making him, urging him to go forward to figure out the truth and come to terms with what he's done, but in a much more direct way now. And then we also uh, have our wrench. Found this on a porch on Lindsay Street. It's a tool used for turning nuts and bolts. So we know from the note written by the patient earlier that they buried something in Rosewater Park. Um, buried under the ground in front of a praying woman. 
And in the first part of the playthrough, we went over to that section of Rosewater Park. In order to talk about that statue, that's the uh, statue of Jennifer Carroll. Jennifer Carroll was a member of the cult who was persecuted by the Christians uh, in the town's history. And they built a statue as kind of a monument to remember her or in her memory. Um, before we start heading over towards Rosewater Park, we're going to go stop off at Neely's Bar. Because there is something significant and uh, different there now. So the first time we went to Neely's Bar, you find the... There's a hole here. It's gone now. Uh, this text... Which is still here. There was a hole here. It's gone now. But now this is here. There's a whole new thing of writing on this wall that was not here the first time you explore. If you really want to see Mary, you should just die. But you might be heading to a different place than Mary, James. So... Again, similar to the note from the doctor, getting to a point where it is very directly referencing James himself. We also have some more writing, very specifically telling James, if you want to see Mary, you should just die. Not particularly subtle, but here's the thing, 100% optional. This is never forced upon you. This is not a necessary part of the game that you have to visit or go through. You never have to go inside Bar Neely ever in this game from start to finish. This is only if you go and explore and you go out of your way and you have to come back and explore it a second time to even see this little bit of writing. So it's an extra. It's something additional to the story as kind of a reward for thorough explanation for a lot of players. And yeah, it, it does start becoming less and less subtle from this point on. Um, Mary is dead. If you want to see Mary, you should just die. Like straight up just telling James, you thinking that she's here alive and wrote you this letter is wrong, <laughs> you know? Um, and then saying you might be heading to a different place than Mary. So if James is under this assumption that Mary as a good person, a good soul would go to heaven or something else uh, in the afterlife, James would probably not be going there because of the things that he's done. So the fact that he's responsible for Mary's death, the fact that, you know, we have these things that are directly um, talking to him, you know, direct messages to him, uh, I still think this kind of falls into the subconscious james is aware of all of this it's just sort of his subconscious way of making him come to terms with it and realizing it rather than necessarily maybe the town like talking to him itself um but i like that it shows that you know james's delusion is starting to break away reality is starting to surface and it's becoming less and less subtle it's it's forcing James to come to terms with it, and it's not going to do it through subtle imagery and subtext anymore. James has to get the picture. He has to, uh, to realize the truth. So, whether it's his subconscious or the town or a combination of the two, Either way, they're going to start being more blunt about it. James' corpse, similar to a lot of the other corpses, where it is just a modified version of James's model. Find them all over town, except in some very specific spots.
There are some very specific spots where it is distinctly different looking corpses. Because they're not... These corpses are sort of manifested from James's subconscious. His desire for um, self-punishment and suicide coming through in seeing himself as a dead body all over the town. Um, but when we start seeing, like, the corpses that Eddie leaves behind, they're distinctly not James. They're other... other unnamed, unidentifiable people. Up until a certain point. One of my favorite turning points... When you start confronting Eddie and Angela directly and getting examples of, you know, these characters perceiving reality differently, like right next to each other, that's when I, I think I love this game the most. The way that it handles playing with not only the character's perspective, but the player's perspective through the characters. And at the very beginning, when we first came to the apartments in part one, um, we stopped over here and took a look at this door. The door that wakes in darkness, opening into nightmares. And when you first encounter this door at the beginning of the game, it is locked. But now that the other world has sort of consumed reality, it is no longer light out. The darkness is here. So the door is open. You can see that puts us out on this end of Cat Street. So we've got a little bit to explore here. We've got the area up there outside of Rosewater Park. Rosewater Park being our ultimate destination where we're headed. Wander around the rest of the town first. Health drink and handgun bullets just sitting out on some stairs. A lot of little extra supplies and things for going around being thorough. And if you're ever interested in just going for a high score, remember high scores in video games and that being a thing people cared about? The Silent Hill games have score. You have a ranking screen at the end of the game. And if you ever want to try to go for the highest rank, which is called 10 star, you basically have to pick up, like, every item. So a lot of these items that are kind of weird and out of the way, you, uh... You kind of have to memorize where all these individual little health drinks and things are. Because if you're doing 10 star, you gotta run around and pick them all up. And you gotta do it quickly. Ten star is like pretty brutal for anyone who's never attempted it before. I play these games all the time and I almost never do 10 star runs. Cause they can very easily go wrong and it's really frustrating to do like an hour and a half run of something with the goal being 10 stars and then you get like nine stars because you accidentally shot one too many things with your shotgun or you accidentally uh, killed too many enemies by stomping on them or you missed it by one enemy kill or you missed it by like one or two item pickups it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. It's just a really, I don't know, frustrating challenge. Even if you're fast and thorough. Silent Hill 1, like some of them are worse than others. 2 is still not really the worst. 1 is pretty bad. Silent Hill 1 10 star. 
it it includes your your accuracy when shooting as part of the criteria which means you basically if you ever use the shotgun you lose because too many of the shotgun pellets will spread and not hit the enemy that you're aiming at and that will count as missed shots and then you just don't get 10 star even if you do everything else perfectly a little too strict So we've made our way over to Rosewater Park. And that statue of Jennifer Carroll, persecuted by the Christians. Here it is. Victim of persecution by the Christians, Jennifer Carroll lived with pride and honor. What happened here shall never be forgotten. So it's a little memorial to this uh, former cult member, Jennifer Carroll, sometime in the town's history where uh, she was persecuted by the Christians. And it's not confirmed, but I have a feeling we actually see, based on the statue and, and how long ago this seems to be implying it, it happened, um, I think we see Jennifer Carroll's cell when we get to the prison a little bit later there's a particular cell in all of the prison, only one that is absolutely full of cult items. Uh, occult ritual items and books about the occult. So, I've got a personal theory. that That's probably Jennifer Carroll's prison cell. Um, and then behind this statue, the ground is raised up only here. Could there be something under here? Dig. Dig, James. Dig into those low-res textures. And there is a small metal box fastened by bolts. The lid can't be opened. Hi, Sophia. I'm welcome. So we dig up the box. There is not a great animation or sound effect for it. It's just sort of... And uh, the box is revealed and it's bolted down. Found this on the porch of Lindsay Street. We can use the wrench. Undo those bolts. Got the old bronze key. That gives us an antique-looking bronze key hidden behind one of the statues lined up in the park. Hi, Sophie. Silent Hill veteran of 13 years. Awesome. I've been playing these games since the first one came out in 1999. And I've been streaming them full-time on Twitch since 2015. Welcome to the channel. I do super in-depth, informative story playthroughs challenge runs, speed runs, and all sorts of playthroughs uh, for every single Silent Hill game in the series. Even stuff like the arcade game, the play novel, uh, all that kind of stuff. I cover all of it as thoroughly as possible on my channel and have been for many years now. So welcome. Always happy to... Uh, have another Silent Hill veteran come by and hang out and enjoy the stream. Just kind of taking a look at where we first met Maria. Some of these uh, other little things. I don't think I stopped and read this last time, so we can look at this. In memory of the 67 who died of illness and now sleep beneath the lake. So... There was a plague. We find some notes that talk about the history of the town and how, like, Brookhaven Hospital came to be and how the Silent Hill Prison came to be and then was eventually closed and built over. Um, 
but there was like a wave of immigration to the area and it brought along with it like a plague. Everybody was getting sick. So this memorial kind of references that. 67 who died of illness and are now sleeping beneath the lake. Uh, Sophie, thank you so much for the sub. Very much appreciate the support. Welcome. Enjoy your time here. Enjoy your Silent Hill themed emotes that you can use all over Twitch. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. And Anonymous with a $25 tip towards the new PC. Thank you so much, Anon. Thank you, thank you, Anonymous. I really appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Uh, I still really, really appreciate the help going towards replacing my PC. We've already raised a good amount, like tw over $1,200 towards it, but the PC that I need to replace was decent and I don't want to just replace it with something that would need to be replaced in another year or two. So um, I'm trying to get something that's pretty good. So I'm hoping uh, some of the computers part total and everything is going to be around 15 to 2000, 1500 to 2000. But that way, once I've got a good, decent, solid rig like that, you know, I won't need to worry about another computer. I can just focus on streaming and making videos and stuff for the next several years before I need to worry about upgrading or anything. Thank you so much for another $25 towards that anonymous. Very, very much appreciated. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is starting to go out. We're probably uh, coming up on the end of this section. Let's make it over to the... Huh? Historical what Society. Was that? Who in the hell was that? And uh, kind of wrap up there. Although while I'm this far, let's go see how far back to the apartments we can we can backtrack this way. <clears throat> Sophie, thank you so much for the 500 bits. I know it's not a lot, but have some biddies towards the new PC. Thank you so much, Sophie. Especially since you're just like just arrived. Um, very kind of you. Thank you so much. Every little bit absolutely helps immensely. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Rosewater Park. And this dark alley leading back towards the apartments is so much creepier revisiting as opposed to in the day in the fog especially with this music the, the wall where we first met Laura oh, James comments on it too just a normal wall the graffiti looks like it was done by a child Somebody even asked during the first part of the playthrough if Laura did this, which we could assume that she did. James even points out that it was, it looks like it's done by a child. And this is where we initially, uh, initially came out of the uh, Blue Creek Apartments. Ah, there's nothing more to do here. Guess I'll go back to looking for Mary. But that's as far as it will let you backtrack, and then you get that text. It doesn't let you back into the apartments. So that's as far as we can go. Now we'll go to the Historical Society. Is the popcorn cart still there? It's a very important symbolism. It is very important symbolism, and also how dare you. It's not a popcorn cart. It's, it's hot dogs and soft pretzels. Get it right. If the remake is going to take it away from us, you can at least show some respect for the hot dog and soft pretzel cart. <laughs> it's 
it's literally like this is it this is where you meet maria it's one of those things that until we started seeing the trailer for the remake where you you have james meeting maria at the end of a dock in like a gazebo it wasn't until that that i even thought about like really thought about where you meet maria the first time and it is kind of funny that it just happens right here she's just standing next to the the hot dog and soft pretzel cart <laughs> something i don't know something endearing about that But we already know the remake is getting rid of the hot dog cart. Say goodbye to the hot dog and soft pretzel cart. Bloober team is going to wrench it away from you. What's my favorite Silent Hill game? This one, Silent Hill 2. You can type exclamation point faves. It's a very common question over the years, so I have a bot command that shows how I rank all of the games personally. where we got the uh, steel pipe. Exxon gas station. Origins lower than downpour? Yep. I don't think either of them is a particularly good game. But downpour is at least an original game. So it tries to do something original and fails at that. Origins fails at being a prequel which makes it worse in my eyes. Like, it not only is bad for its own original story, but it gets a lot of aspects of Silent Hill 1's story wrong. So I, I consider that much worse, less palatable in a game than something like Downpour, which is like, not something that I enjoy or think is very good, but it's at least trying to do something original. It's not trying to be a sequel to an existing Silent Hill game or a prequel to an existing Silent Hill game. It's very distinctly doing its own thing. I just don't think it did its own thing very well, but that's beside the point. Origins, that fucks with established storyline and Team Silent games, and that is that's a big no-no in my eyes. All right, the Silent Hill Historical Society. We've made it. We've used the old bronze key. We get some foreshadowing of the final boss fight. The very first thing, this this camera angle showing us this uh, painting on the wall. And if you look at that painting, that is like similar to the rooftop area where we fight uh, Mary final boss at the end of this game. Nothing particular interest inside the glass case, at least not on new game. On new game plus, uh, inside this next room with the next glass case, there is the obsidian goblet. We're not doing any, not doing any, uh, New Game Plus stuff on this playthrough. There probably used to be a painting here. Only the explanation remains. Waterfront Landscape. Alan Smith. Date of birth and death unknown. A scene of this area from long ago. From the style, it looks like it was done sometime around 1820. There were a lot fewer people then, and only a handful of buildings. So, a little bit of history, even with a painting missing, just to get an idea of the town history, 1820s, uh, how there were fewer people, how there were less um, buildings, how less developed the town itself was. 
group of people here. Names with no comment on them. We're going to talk about the big obvious one in a moment. A photo is hanging here. The Wilts Coal Mine. So this is something that I've brought up before. And since this mentions it, it's worth talking about like how different the Silent Hill movie is from the games and how the movie plot sort of tainted a lot of people's understanding of Silent Hill as a whole, where a lot of people who never played the games or were very only loosely familiar with the games first were introduced to Silent Hill through the Silent Hill movie. And a lot of people would think that the Silent Hill movie, because it was received relatively well, would be a good adaptation of these games. And it's not. And I like the first movie. I like it for what it is. Um, I don't think it's like a masterpiece of horror cinema or anything, but I think it's like a bad B movie that's enjoyable. Um, but as far as like a representation of Silent Hill, storyline wise, character wise, everything like that, no, it is the furthest thing from that. Not a good representation of the game story. So the movie starts the whole plot line of there's a coal mine under Silent Hill that catches fire and is still burning. If there's not snow in the town, that there's ash, blah, blah, blah. All that comes from the movie. All that literally comes from these co the co-script writer for the first Silent Hill movie, Roger Avery, basing that depiction of the town in the movie on the real world Centralia, Pennsylvania, which is a coal mine that's burning and everything. Um, but the games, this game, Silent Hill 1, like none of the Team Silent games, Team Silent didn't know anything about Centralia. They didn't base anything on Centralia. They didn't have this coal mine fire. Coal mining is part of the, the game's history of the town, though. Um, but there's nothing so interesting about it, like it catching fire. It's literally just the Wilts coal mine. The coal mines were how the town initially was settled and prospered. The mines were eventually cleared out and they couldn't rely on mining anymore um, for a town profit. So they had to come up with something else for the town to make money. And that's where they started doing tourism based around Lake Toluca. So it's an, an important part of the history and kind of the development of the town and what got it up to the point where it is. But the coal mine is not as significant as they make it out to be in the Silent Hill movies. They also completely change what the coal mine is called from game to game. Like Again, Downpour references the coal mines and stuff as well, um, but they are the Gillespie coal, you know, and mining company um, rather than the, the Wilts coal mine. Interesting stuff. Little, little bit of tidbit there. Common misinformation to get cleared up. And finally, the last big thing to talk about in this room. This picture here, and I would love a life-size rendition of this stick in my room. Misty Day, Remains of the Judgment. It's him. Got this wonderful Masahiro Ito artwork of Pyramid Head. Notice he is no longer holding the Great Knife. Uh, after Brookhaven Hospital, we never see Pyramid Head with a great knife again. Um, we only see him with the spear. You can see the victims hanging in the back in their cages. Those cages, similar to the Flesh Lips boss that we fought at the end of Brookhaven. Um, even with the legs hanging down below the cage. Uh, so we see that, that similarity there. And... That symbolism that I was talking about during the Flesh Lips boss fight is still here as well. The cages uh, and theme of cages in this game representing bed frames, um, representing Mary being bedridden, being suffering with this illness for so long that she couldn't get out of bed to the point where her bed kind of became her cage. Which is why we keep seeing... Enemies like the Flesh Lips with this cage on top of them. Artwork and symbolism uh, such as this that has the cages on them. The final boss itself being designed with a similar cage around it. 
And uh, we have Pyramid Head himself. And it's theorized like that, and it makes sense that this painting, what a lot of people suspect from like a lore standpoint, and even Masahiro Ito has hinted at this and talked about it to some degree on Twitter, where Harry, uh, Harry, James and Mary, when they first came to Silent Hill on vacation, um, this was like, for, for more more or less a regular resort town. They enjoyed their vacation here. Um, and part of that vacation, they would have come to the historical, so uh, historical society as something to do, to, to look at the museum, look at the history of the town. And it's theorized that this is a real painting. This isn't something that's manifested, that this is a real historical painting that's in the historical society representing the executioners from the town's history since they're described as wearing similar robes and wearing hoods that these large hoods would resemble sort of a pyramid or cone shape uh, whenever they were being worn so a lot of people theorize that this is kind of where pyramid head comes from this painting this image of the executioners of the town's past being represented like this and then James coming to the town seeking punishment for himself desiring to be punished for what he's done and that desire for punishment sort of manifesting itself through the town's power into Pyramid Head and when it needed to give Pyramid Head a physical shape that is relevant to James's feelings on it and that desire for punishment he took on the shape of those executioners from the town's past that he had seen a painting of it makes sense to me um it's making a lot of assumptions making the assumption that james came here with mary making the assumption that this painting is real and existed in this place when james came here with his wife so it's a lot of assumptions to make to make that work but not a bad headcanon theory and as said even ito himself kind of hints towards it. Um, and with that, I think this is where I'm going to call it for today. 